Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, folks? And welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you. Big, big show coming up. Lots to talk about heading into the long weekend. Discussing the Winnipeg Jets coaching situation and, of course, potential player movement coming out of the many of the rumors around the National Hockey League the last few days. Ken Weeb's going to join us for an extended conversation. We're going to do that next in about 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then Brandon Wicke's going to join us from Parts Unknown today. Rue getting a bit of a head start from the long weekend, but we'll certainly have time to join us here on WST. Looking forward to getting his thoughts. And we're not forgetting about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, who are back at practice today albeit without Nick Dembski and Eddie Tate of BlueBombers.com coming up in the second hour of the program. And we will also, well, we'll drop the marbles for you. Everyone's asking, will there be marbles today? Because there's no Friday show. Damn right there will be. We'll finish off the short week with a Thursday marble race. So uh, make sure you stick around for that. And um, if you're wondering what the hell we're talking about, when you're new, first and foremost, make sure you hit that red subscribe button on the YouTube page and uh, just be around. It'll be your chance to win our version of the Masters Green Jacket, the blue Winnipeg Sports Talk CC hoodie. And um, it's a great way to get into the weekend. Now, I will say this. I kind of thought that maybe by this point, we'd have a better idea of who the Winnipeg Jets head coach is. But we are certainly hearing reports from insiders around the league that that list, uh, second interviews have been pretty much completed and the list is being pared down right now. Uh, we're going to talk all about it with Ken Weeb coming up in just a few minutes. Um, before we get to everything, I want to give a big thanks to all of our um, great sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Cool Bet Canada, Canadian Club, Assiniboia Downs, Breezy Bend, Little Brown Jug, Not Auto Corp, Royal Sports, Manitoba Battery, Culligan Water, Vita Health Fresh Market, F Apparel, Wallace & Wallace, and Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. Um, let's get Remus in here and get things going. Remo, uh, I know that you, uh, like many, are excited to uh, get going on uh, this long weekend, but holy smokes, we've got a lot to talk about. It seems like there is not a day that goes by uh, without some interesting new tidbits or notes about the Winnipeg Jets, um, because as everyone has talked about, particularly here on this program for the last couple of months, big changes are expected, a new head coach, potential player movement, and none of it's happened yet, but we are going into probably the most pivotal week of the year as a week from right now, we'll be getting ready for round one of the NHL draft in Montreal, where the Jets will be picking 14th and 30th, but probably more importantly and notably when we talk about the players on the roster right now, that is the time when the majority of significant deals are made. We had a big deal yesterday in the National Hockey League, RFA Kevin Fiala going to the LA Kings for a first round selection in the draft and uh, a second rounder, a prospect who was the captain of the, uh, the, uh, the Minnesota of uh, the Minnesota golden Gophers. Um, we can get into that, but uh, plenty of intrigue as we go into the long weekend here on WST. What's up? This is so much fun every day. What news are we going to have yesterday report? Thank you. Francois Gagnon for saying that, uh, you know, the jets engaged in talks, with the Rangers about Pierre, about, uh, sorry, yeah, Pierre Luc Dubois. And interestingly, Larry Brooks of the New York Post wrote late last night that it was Kevin Cheveldayoff who made the call to the Rangers. Well, he said about, he wouldn't be surprised sorry, if that yeah, was yeah, the yeah. case. Sorry, sorry. Like, He's, sorry. Yeah. Oh, we'll put it in this way. He said he believes that is more likely than not that Cheveldayoff made the calls. So, yes. Yeah, so you have to put it like that. You can't say definitively one way. But for a guy who's always says, hey, when the phone rings, you pick it up. It was interesting to hear that. It's possible that Chevy was more likely that he made the call than not. So we'll wait and see what happens. It's been fun to speculate about Pierre-Luc Dubois and which of the Rangers' prospects um, would be coming back to the Jets. Uh, we talked about that with Marat yesterday. That's in a video on our YouTube channel. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, coming up with Ken Wee. But today, it was Kevin Weeks with the bomb. Uh, putting out his tweet, a keep it with his keep an eye on series. It wasn't a video; it was a keep an eye on. <laughs> Sources tell me as of today, 
that Jets head coach candidates are down to Scott Arneal, Rick Tockett, Jim Montgomery, Jeff Blaschel, and Pascal Vincent. And yesterday it was Darren Dreger who had reported that two or three. There's uh, Kevin Weeks reporting five. And I retweeted it from the Winnipeg Sports Hub account. Here's Weeksy with an update. And some guy's like, well, what's the update? I'm like, well, we hadn't heard Jeff Blaschel's name mentioned at all in connection with the Jets. Jeff Blaschel previously with the Detroit Red Wings. So um, very interesting as the Jets coach watch heating up here. Yeah, and uh, Elliot Friedman jumped on with Jeff Merrick earlier today, as he often does, his partner on the 32 Thoughts podcast, um, and said that he believes that, you know, late addition Jeff Blaschel to the candidates for Winnipeg Jets head coaching job has a real chance to get the job. And I'm sure many of you are going, wait, Jeff Blaschel? Who? I mean, yeah, Jeff Blaschel. He's been the head coach of the Detroit Red Wings for the last seven years. Been the good soldier for Steve Eiserman. Made the playoffs in year one. Um, and then was the head coach for the last six seasons as they missed the playoffs. And um, I think it's important to note, situation is everything. And, you know, in a lot of ways, Blaschel was the good, sho- good soldier for Iserman, who had a clear plan, the Iser plan, if you will, and that plan involved sucking for a number of years, um, you know, to try to build and develop the assets um, that started to bear fruit this season with the likes of Morris Sider and Lucas Raymond having those wonderful rookie seasons and Sider winning the Calder Trophy to get back to, um, back to you know, to respectability and then contention. Um, you know, seven years in any spot is a long time. I think it speaks to, you know, what Eiserman thought of Blashill, that he kept him throughout that. Um, and, and it is important to note as well, this is a guy that has won at other levels. He won a championship in the USHL and won the Calder Cup in his first year as the head coach of the Grand Rapids Griffins. So um, it's an intriguing name. I don't know much uh, more to that, but I'm not surprised considering the background of you know many people in True North and the American Hockey League, but you go right up to the top, but also Kevin Chevaldeoff, Craig Heisinger. Um, they'd have a pretty keen idea about what Jeff Plaschel did at other levels, as well as what he went through over the last little while. Now, I'm not saying that Jeff Blaschel, by any stretch of the imagination, is the front runner, um, but you have to take it seriously when someone like Elliot Friedman is throwing that out. We're going to get into all the names with Ken a little bit later on, but it does sound like in addition to Jeff Blaschel, four other names remain still standing as potential head coaches of the Winnipeg Jets. Jim Montgomery, Rick Tockett, Scott Arneal, and Pascal Vincent, along with Jeff Blaschel. Um, and from what we understand, Reem, most of the second interviews, if not all the second interviews, have taken place right now. And I would think that there will be some discussions, some negotiations over the course of this weekend. And I would be quite surprised if we don't have some clarity over who the next head coach is by the time we're back at it on uh, on Tuesday. And now uh, who knows, or excuse me, on Monday. And who knows, maybe, maybe even breaking in at some point over the course of the weekend for a little bit update if news does break. I don't think anyone's going to be introduced until after the long weekend, uh, but it does sound like the Winnipeg Jets are getting closer to some, uh, some closure and then being able to move on and figure out what this roster is going to look like for whoever the head coach is next year, the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, when Kevin Weeks says his keep an eye on tweet out, Hus, you feel like the wheels are in motion. I'm hoping, I got my fingers crossed, we don't have an announcement tomorrow. They want to, or, uh, but I think it's going to happen. There's some insider will break the news. Hopefully, Kevin Weeks, we're hoping for the video. And then maybe there'll be a formal announcement next, next week, maybe early or at the draft. Um, people are asking, I see a lot of people in chat mentioning there was a report or a rumor about Jim Montgomery going to the Bruins. Um, Andy Strickland of FS Midwest, who's pretty on top of things, he said that he doesn't believe that is true, at least at this time. You know, it could happen in the future, but uh, Jim Montgomery is still out there and available. So I just wanted to clear that up. So I say, you know, this rumor season, spelled S-Z-N, and <laughs> if you're gonna <laughs> if you're going to be following... Uh, NHL rumors, I would say stick to uh, the blue check marks. Uh, Kevin Weeks, Frank, Darren Dreger, Elliot, I've, who, Pierre Lebron. That would, those would be your main ones. I, I like Andy Strickland, too. He throws stuff out there. But, you know, you know who to, who to go with. So if someone's throwing something out and you don't really know who they are, then 
I would not believe that. So, um, well, we'll keep an eye on all, all the stuff here. That's where we're at right now uh, with the Jets head coach, sir. Yeah, and, and listen, we're going to talk about it with Weber coming up in just a few minutes here on the program. We'll have an extended convo with him and then uh, get Brandon's thoughts a little bit later on. Again, we will also talk Bombers uh, because CFL kicks off tonight. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to this BC Ottawa game. We'll see what Nate Rourke can do, or Nathan Rourke, excuse me, can do as the two and O BC Lions go Is on the it road Nathan to take Rourke? on the it's Ottawa not, Red Because they were going with Michael Riley all last year. We had to adjust from Mike to Mike. Is it? It's not Nate Rourke. Uh, no, it, I think I, 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 I'm taking liberties with his name, which I've done numerous <laughs> times for many years, and just sort of glossed someone with whatever I wanted to call them. But I'm pretty sure the. Uh, you, you, if you're watching the game tonight on the tube, I think they'll be calling him Nathan Rourke as okay. opposed to, uh, to to Nate. And maybe it's just watching so much of the avalanche and being seeing Nathan McKinnon, Nate McKinnon going back and forth. Uh, that is regardless. We'll talk CFL. Ed Tate's going to jump on with us. We'll get an update from Blue Bomber practice. Um, find out what's going on with the club over the course of the long weekend. They sort of just had their long weekend, if you will. Um, and now it's preparing for that Monday game. What a weird, but I'm down with it. Monday night football coming out of a long weekend. Bombers Argos. Uh, that will be on Monday. So Ed Tate coming up in the second hour of the program as well as some marbles heading into the long weekend. One other thing I want to get to right now, and of course we'll talk about this with Ken and Brandon Remo, uh, was Frank Saravelli over at DFO today uh, talking about Mark Shifley's situation. And it is very interesting how things have somewhat seemingly changed with what we're hearing from people that have pretty good connections to the inside. Um, Frank today saying quite emphatically um, that he believes that Mark Shifley is going to be back with the Winnipeg Jets next season. And, um, you know, I mean, I guess that shouldn't be too much of a surprise. And I think we've sort of seen, you know, going from Darren Drager a month ago saying that he doesn't see a scenario that Mark Shifley is on the Winnipeg Jets next year to now through from most people saying that there's quite a high possibility that that actually will be the case. Um, I do wonder, though, how connected the Shifley situation is and potentially running it back with Mark is connected to the trade rumors involving Captain Blake Wheeler, as well as, you know, the developments on the uncertainty of Pierre-Luc Dubois' future here in Winnipeg, which is two years left on his deal. Yeah, well, you have Mark Shifley cost control at $6.125 million for the next two years, and if Pierre-Luc Dubois doesn't want to re-sign long-term... Can't, I don't think trading them both is ideal if you're looking um, to contend or even you know, take a shot at making the playoffs uh, in the next season. So um, I agree. I think there is some related there. But if you want to look at like a shakeup, uh, Blake Wheeler seems to be the player who would more likely than not be on the move coming in at number three on Frank Cervalli's list. So it is interesting how things have shifted. I think we can all agree that the Jets do need some kind of roster uh, rejigging where, you know, you move some players out, you know, bring someone new in is, you know, what's well, the term that we keep hearing? It's gone stale there. And we saw that again, we, we just referenced Calgary all the time, at least I do, where they moved out Giordano and came back in last year and were in first place in their division. Now, I don't know for the Jets is going to be a lot tougher. I think a bit tougher hill to climb, but I think it does make sense to keep Mark Shifley and you hope a new coach can breathe some life into this uh, into this team and get him to play a, a better two-way game. And then we'll see what happens with Pierre-Luc Dubois. Maybe you do go with the one year and reevaluate next year. But again, you're always looking for offers. But I I think it does make sense to go with uh, Mark Shafley as you have him already in her contract for the two years with that reasonable AAV. I mean, we saw like, Kevin Fiala got uh, yesterday as an RFA. Yeah, listen, I know you always make this comparison from Calgary to Winnipeg and, you know, Giordano because he was the captain. But it is important to note that, first of all, they were absolutely forced into that. They did not want to do that. But, I mean, they had players that they had to protect. Giordano was, what, 39 years old at the time or yes. 38 years old. Um, and to lose a much younger asset with a much better future, to hold on to Giordano for one more year... Um, was something that they just couldn't stomach and they didn't do. Um, like like this, this, we all know. I mean, Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler have been the culture carriers for the Winnipeg Jets for the last number of years. And 
I mean, for what it's worth, I think most people observing the hockey club, and certainly if you were paying any attention to what was said by the majority of players at the end of last season, that you know it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good atmosphere around the Winnipeg Jets, and and I mean Shifley, and again we'll get to this with Ken in a little bit, had you know his uh, his press conference at the end of the season, which sounded like a guy that was a free agent as opposed to a guy that was a leader on this team with a letter on his chest with two years left on his contract. But I do subscribe to what you just said that you know the situation may indicate that you know especially considering what may or may not happen going forward with Pierre Luc Dubois um, that you know maybe Mark Scheifele they they do need to come back under a new head coach and listen I'd love to see it work I mean I think I've been pretty clear over the course of the you know the last number of months that you know there was a number of players that you know I don't think or I think contributed to, you know, what's happened to this team over the last couple of years. And, you know, when you look at it, you got to start at the top, um, you know, with the with the captains. And this goes to the leadership group and why I think, you know, we needed a change as well as needed the opportunity for the likes of a Nikolai Ehlers to play a much more prominent role um, and get the ice time that his production has deserved. So I guess now, you know, Blake Wheeler is the guy. No, listen, Blake Wheeler is the captain of the team. And I mean, he would have as much to do with the culture of the team as any, but at the same time, the return for Blake Wheeler is going to be nothing like it would be for Mark Shifley. But if that is the case, um, I mean, and there's also the fact of the matter is that the Winnipeg Jets made that trade for Pierre-Luc Dubois, knowing that, you know, they'd have two pretty dominant centers. Um, and I guess there certainly is the possibility that you come back like that. Um, but it is, I mean, as I said, there's so many things flowing around, you know, this, especially considering the news of Elliot Freedom of uh, what of last week, that Pierre-Luc Dubois' intention is to test unrestricted free agency. Um, you know, if Dubois was able to sign a long-term deal, I think we're having a very different conversation right now. Um, and all of that sets up, Remo, you know, for what could be the most interesting week we've had for the Winnipeg Jets off the ice, maybe since they got here, to be perfectly honest with you, with the uh, assumed adding a new head coach and hiring a new head coach, as well as some potential moves next year. And make no mistake about it, if Blake Wheeler is traded, um, you know, this is the guy. I mean, he's the last holdover from the Atlanta Thrashers. He has been the captain for a number of years. He's been incredibly productive. Um and if Blake Wheeler's not on the Winnipeg Jets, I think that leaves a huge vacuum, if you will, um, an opportunity for a number of other players, like we were saying last year, need to be given that opportunity to step up and be the culture carriers, if you will, and create a new atmosphere and culture of the Winnipeg Jets. Um, what will be interesting is how many players are moved out and when those happen. But I do think that there's a significant possibility that some of those deals, if they're going to happen, happen next week, in addition to getting a new head coach. I agree. It does feel like the Winnipeg Jets are at a crossroads here. Do they go with an inexperienced coach who tries to you know, keep the team running into contention, or do you go with a younger guy and maybe go with more of a retooling, or do you combine both into one thing? But I, I agree if Blake Wheeler is moved, and he was number three on Frank Saravelli's trade targets list, and it would signal a turning of the page and a rebuilding of a of a new culture. And I, I'm not sure what to make of it. We'll have to see who you know what the team looks like heading into next year. But um, you know they've kind of just been going slowly down, and since the uh, 2019 playoff loss, and could this be an opportunity to you know move forward? And we looked at the, you know the power rankings last year in terms of the Central Division. I mean, the but the Avs are a powerhouse. I think the Blues are, are pretty solid. But after that, I mean, what's Minnesota? Uh, do you believe in Nashville? How are they going to look? So I think there is definitely room for Jets to make the playoff spot. And when you have Connor Hellebuck, anything can happen. So, um, you know, we've been talking about the forwards, but also there is that defense issue as well. And we're going to talk about that with Ken. You know, they have all these veteran guys when you have the young guys coming in. Uh, Billy Hanel and Dylan Samberg are one and two, but you have other capable play guys who stepped in last year as well, and you have to free up some salary to bring in some help on forward. So, so many questions about the Jets. We felt like last year it was, okay, they have to fix the defense. Uh, they seem to fix, they brought in guys, but it was maybe the coaching that was the issue. Now you have to fix the coaching and maybe restructure 
some of the way you spend money while also changing your leadership. So there's like three, there's like three, <laughs> th- three or four things on Chevy's to do list that you have to accomplish this off season. And a lot of it could take place next week or maybe next summer. Well, or sorry, and, and, or later know, on this summer. And you know, and just going back to free agency, I'm just trying to look and see who was the um, uh, who was the drop. This they said, um, you know, Gabriel Landeskog tested free agency as well last year, uh, but you know, ended up deciding deciding to stay. Well, I mean, this is the thing; it's a hell of a lot easier to keep your players um, and get them to the deal that makes sense for the hockey club if you're knocking on the door of the Stanley Cup, and I think that's why it. It was logical almost that a guy like Pierre Luc Dubois would say, I'm going to just kind of take my time here and, you know, we'll see what happens in a couple of years based on what he's been through in the year and a half here with the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, if things completely turn around and he has a monster season playing with Kyle Connor next year and the Jets are, you know, a contender once again and there's a really bright future, maybe we're talking about a very different scenario. And I think that's the best case um, for the Winnipeg Jets. But at the same time, I mean, you have to be your, doing your due diligence and looking at all possibilities. Um, and I don't know how much sleep shovel day I've been getting very getting lately. Um, first on the head coaching spot, but then also what's happening going into next week. And yes, the defense core is another thing that you know we spent hours talking about last year. I mean, as well as going into this off season, that something's got to give with the talented young defensemen that the Jets as an organization have put so much into. Um, that are knocking on the door, you got to have room for some of these guys to play. And to your point, Remus, if you do move one or two of the veterans that are making more up front and move in younger players on entry-level contracts, certainly gives you more money, whether it be in free agency, whether it be in trades, to bring back to shore up the forward group, which, to be frank, is nowhere near as deep as it was when this team really was knocking on the door three seasons ago as one of the top teams in the Western Conference. But back to the Central for a minute before we get to Ken. Um, You make a great point. Like, what are the Minnesota Wild going to be next year? I mean, Kevin Fiala traded yesterday for a first-round pick and a prospect um, and signing a monster deal, seven years at just under $8 million a season. And good for Fiala. Um, and it's a great ad for the LA Kings who think that they're contending. Um, but do the Minnesota Wild over the next three seasons take a significant step back because of the cap penalties that they're incurring for the buyouts of Parise and Suter? And where are the Nashville Predators? And I think the biggest tell on all of that, Reem, is going to be what happens with Philip Forsberg, who's an unrestricted free agent. And, uh, you know, he's the all time Predators leading goal scorer. He has been incredibly productive for the majority of his career. He certainly on the open market will be able to command a very, very great salary. Um, And, you know, the question is, does he stay in Nashville or does he leave? If he leaves, where does that leave the Predators going forward? So I'm with you. I think that there is an opportunity in this division to sort of quickly turn things around and at least get into the mix as being a playoff team. I don't think any of the teams, including St. Louis, who I think is a clear number two right now, is really going to be knocking on the door and significantly challenging Colorado, barring maybe a bit of a setback. But Colorado has a ton of players to re-sign as well. I mean, there is the possibility they could lose the likes of Kadri and Burakovsky, um, we go down the list. They've got about six uh, you know, unrestricted free agents and where that leaves them. So um, there hasn't been a lot determined yet, but it seems like day by day, there's more and more for us to talk about here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And um, as I said, it should be an interesting weekend. I'm very glad that the holiday is Friday as opposed to Monday, because I can tell you one thing, in addition to it being a bomber game day and bombers taking on the Argos, which we'll certainly touch on, Monday's show heading into Thursday's round one of the draft and Friday's round two through seven um, is going to be, uh, uh, I've been looking forward to this week for a while. I thought maybe there'd be more stuff done up until then. But as I said, it's been, uh, it's given us no shortage of topics to talk about. Certainly we've heard from all of you in the chat and I've uh, been getting amazing feedback and uh, that is why we do it. And um, we'll be later on in the summer when things quiet down, we'll be thinking back to the end of June and how crazy these shows were. So, uh, so bring it on. Let's find out who the next head coach is and see what happens with the Winnipeg Jets. 
next week heading into round one of the draft, of course, where they do have two first round selections. By the way, speaking of the draft, if you missed yesterday's show, we had a great conversation with Chris Peters, the draft expert from Daily Faceoff. Uh, I think we put that out separately. You can check our uh, social feeds uh, if you haven't already for a great rundown of the draft overall and a number of the players, because I do have a feeling that while normally we'd spend more time talking about the prospects. Um, it's going to be more about the coach and potential trades next week for the Winnipeg Jets uh, that we'll be discussing until, of course, those picks come off the board and we find out who the new members of the organization are. are, are. All right, we're going to get to bring in Weaver here. Rewiki later on, Ed Tate, Marbles, uh, but there's lots to get with Ken coming up. Um, hey, I want to give a big shout out to our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, the spot in Winnipeg where you'll find the best selection of local organic natural grocery supplements and beauty products, all at great prices with an amazing knowledgeable staff trained on these products. Hey, if you've got a candidate party you're going on, first of all, you'll have some incredible healthy options like bison burgers and lean bison steaks and chicken to throw on the grill and some other phenomenal non-alcoholic products products that will make a great addition for some of your guests that might not be getting into it. Pop down and visit them at any of their seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge. And you can find out uh, more online and their fully shoppable website at myvita.ca. Probably not a lot of suits going on this weekend, although if you're in a wedding, you certainly will be. And if you have in a wedding, you're going to want to talk to the guys at F Apparel about getting fitted out for you and the fellas. 15% off on your custom suits that begin at $400 for your wedding party. Every guy needs at least one suit that fits and looks great. And F is the leader in Winnipeg for those. And they've got much more than suits, though. Chinos, golf pants, uh, dress shirts, accessories, and more. Pop down and see them at 190 Smith Street or check them out online at F. That's EPHapparel.com. Wallace and Wallace has been busy. Hopefully the guys will get a few days off. Uh, if you've been anywhere in the city, you've seen their fences and trucks all over the place. Uh, bottom line is, if you need the protection and security of a new fence, Wallace and Wallace are the best in the biz. They've got it all. Vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood options. And hey, if it's time to replace your garage door, they've got Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors. 452-2700 is the number. An expert from Wallace and Wallace will come out and give you a free estimate. And you can also visit them at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. And uh, I'm counting down the days till we get out to Aikens Lake uh, at Wilderness Lodge. I know a lot of people, you'll be uh, sticking a line in the water on the long weekend, doing a little fishing. From all accounts, the fishing all over the province is incredible. Uh, but in addition to great fishing, uh, one of the coolest spots around in the province, fully off the grid, fly in. You can be on the water in less than two hours. And maybe what separates Aikens from everywhere else is the incredible people running it, run by Pitt Turen and his awesome family. Um, Find out more about potential openings later on this summer and certainly for next year, whether it be for a family and friends trip or a corporate gathering online, AkinsLake.com or on social media at Aikens Lake. All right, let's get to it. So much to get to with Kenny Weeb. Let's bring in Weber now on WST. Don't worry for whoever it was that um, donated to the channel for gravel for everyone last week because of the motion sickness for Ken's epic journey on the way to the haircut. He is back in the wake up studios and joining us, uh, joining us now. Weber, welcome back home quickly. How's the cup? Oh, Huss, it was uh, tremendous. Uh, happy to report. Got all four loads of laundry done uh, when I got home. Uh, absolutely tremendous. Incredible month, Huss, to be honest. Western Conference final and the final. I think I've slept in my own bed, I think, two or three nights out of the last 30. But uh, just an incredible journey and awesome to see uh, this fun NHL season wrapping up with the uh, championship. And, yeah, it was wild. I mean, being on the ice, uh, seeing the celebrations after the trophy was handed out was uh, just a, a real thrill. I had covered two games of the final in 2011, right before the Jets, uh, right after the Jets announcement was made. With the Moose being the primary affiliate of the Vancouver Canucks, I was able to get to see Alex Burrow's overtime winner in Game Two, and then uh, the disappointment of Game Seven for the Canucks, and being able to chronicle that at the uh, Post Media Network when I was at the Sun. But uh, this was a start to finisher for me, and it was awesome to be on the scene and to see. Uh, we talk about joy level a lot, Hus. Uh, to see the joy level. Uh, for all of those, uh, you know, fans that made the journey and also for the players. I mean, this is a team that had Heartbreak Hotel the last three seasons 
And to see them get over the top and to dethrone the two-time champs, uh, it was quite a sight to behold. It's all old news now, Ken. Let's get on to <laughs> let's get on to the important topics at hand. I mean, my God, we could probably talk for two hours about what's happening around the Winnipeg Jets. I want to get to some yeah. player players that have been mentioned in the trade talks. What made it be uh, happening next week? Uh, but let's start off with the head coaching situation. Um, of course, last Friday we found out that Barry Trotz would not be coming here to Winnipeg. What have you learned about what's happened so far this week leading up to this afternoon, heading into the long weekend, and how close the Winnipeg Jets might be to announcing the uh, permanent replacement for Paul Maurice and obviously Dave Lowry as an interim coach? Yeah, you bet, Hussle. Barry Trotz uh, was a topic of conversation throughout the you know, Stanley Cup final. And uh, what we have learned since returning home here is that this was the week that a lot of the second interviews had taken place. Uh, my understand, I was able to confirm there were four for sure. And Kevin Weeks uh, has confirmed Jeff Blaschel as the fifth guy who was in for a second interview. I believe that's Rick Tockett, Scott O'Neill, Pascal Vincent, and Jim Montgomery are the other finalists. I believe Andrew Burnett was contacted, but I don't think he was at the situ or at the point where he was ready to do an interview. And because the Jets were so far along the process, I, I don't, you know, not confirmed. And it's always possible that he emerges, but I don't think he is at a formal interview at this stage of the game. Uh, right now, it's tough to sort of get a feel for maybe if there is a front runner or not. Um, if I had to put the uh, I had to put the crystal ball to work here, I would say that right now Rick Tockett is probably the number one choice for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, There's always going to be a debate as to whether he's ready to come back out of TV, but let's just remember he was in TV in this booth for one year. This is a guy with coaching in his blood bloodlines, and I think that if the offer is right, I think Rick Tockett is a guy who wants to get back behind the bench. Uh, I still think the Jets are definitely in deliberations. I don't think they have made their final decision, uh, but right now I would probably say that Rick Tockett uh, is the probable front runner uh, and again i'm not trying to coach it but that that's the best i can do with the information that i have right now but all fa five candidates uh, definitely made an impression during the interview process and we'll see where it goes from here I, in terms of the timeline I, I we've talked about it they would like to have a guy in place by the draft but it's more important that they get it right so to me it's not about hustling to get this done before the weekend. It's about ensuring they get the candidate that they want to have behind the bench. And, and what I would also say, I think that Scott O'Neill, uh, whether it's as head coach or associate, uh, would have a very good chance to be on the Jets bench, uh, regardless of, of uh, you know, how it plays out here. And I, and I do think he's still very much in the running as well. Uh, Talkett's an interesting candidate in that he does have some head coaching experience. He's been out of the game, but he's been very much around the game, as you mentioned, you know, as a uh, as an analyst for NHL broadcast this season. Um, what do you, what's attractive about Rick Talkett? When you think about him as a head coaching candidate to come in in this particular situation, why do you think he might be near the top of the list? Yeah, so for me, Rick Tockett's time, again, you, you can look at his time in Tampa and Arizona as a head coach, and, you know, it, you know, it didn't go as well, but I would say the rosters at both those situations and, you know, specifically at times the goaltending weren't great for him. I think it's his work with the Pittsburgh Penguins that has a lot of people excited about Rick Tockett and what he could do with the roster, especially a roster like the Jets that has Connor Hellebuck as the stabilizing force and net uh, I think he's a guy who is really able to connect with Yevgeny Malkin. That's one of the stories we've always heard about his ability to bring out the best in Malkin at a time when Malkin was really in an interesting period in his life. Us, right? I mean, the whole Crosby, you know, they're teammates and they, you know, they've played together for a long time, but there was always this belief that Malkin was in the shadow of Sidney Crosby at times. And, you know, he sometimes played his best hockey when Crosby was unfortunately on the sidelines and injured so to me, Tockett's ability to connect with players is something that re is really appealing about his situation. And the one thing that we saw when he was the head coach of the Arizona Coyotes, this is a guy that's in there digging in, doing the drills, doing the skating with the guys. I mean, he's a real player's coach, but he also still has a little bit of an old school, hard nosed approach. Uh, he's an excellent communicator. Uh, he really sees the game well. And Hus, we talked about it a lot. This is a guy that played the game at the highest level. He was involved in those Canada Cup teams. He was a star in his own team, but he also played a, it was a role as a role player on that vintage 87 Canada Cup team. So I think there's a lot of things going for Rick Tockett in this scenario. And it's not just because he's also a member of the Bald Brotherhood. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, being part of the brotherhood notwithstanding, 
Um, you know, we've spent pl plenty of times talking about what ailed this club last year and some of the issues that they had more internally. Um, and I think part of the reason why I think so many of us, there was a number of other things about Barry Trotz. The resume speaks for itself. But you knew that he'd be able to come in and command the respect immediately of the leadership of the leadership group and every player in that dressing room. Um, and listen, you hope that these guys will be professional and would would treat anybody the same. But I think there are questions based on what happened last year as to how you know certain players would react to different guys based on their resumes. The one thing about Rick Tockett, with everything that you just laid out, um, I think he absolutely would command um, you know the respect immediately walking in based on what he's done coaching, but almost more what he's done as a player with the incredible career that he had. Yeah, no doubt about that. And again, this is the one thing that uh, is very odd. And I mean, Dave Lowry played the game for a long time, more than a thousand games. And I still think he did have the respect of the majority of players, but um, for some reason he didn't connect with all of the players or there were some players on their own program, if you will. So um, I, I think that that's an issue that the Jets are going to definitely tackle and attack in this off season. And I do think that Rick's ability to have played the game at such a high level uh, would certainly help his bolster his candidacy in this situation and yeah I mean th those are things that I'm sure Rick has expressed in the interview process I mean the, how he would handle certain things who who he wants to be involved or uh, who he wants to have involved in the team moving forward and you know I think it's very simple I mean Rick has a good job that he enjoys but I think again his passion is for coaching and I think that a coaching opportunity would be something that would be appealing to him and I think that Rick would look at this job much like the other candidates and see opportunity uh, I know there's been a lot of debate over what direction the Jets are going to go or should go uh, on the old social media channels, but um, you know it sounds like Rick would be in that camp of thinking that this is not a rebuilding process. This is a retooling and try to be competitive right away process. Uh, um, uh, what did you make of the name Jeff Blashill being popped out there? I mean, he was sort of one of the guys that was somewhat off the yeah. radar, and of course, he spent the last seven years in Detroit, and you know, I mean, really, it's sort of been tasked with um, essentially overseeing a tank job by a team that yeah. was incredibly successful for so long. It made the playoffs in his first year at 41 wins and then six straight years out of the playoffs. Um, you know, and for many of the same reasons why I think Scott Arneal is a candidate, you know, with the great work that he did when he was an American hockey league coach, you yeah. look at those three years in grand Rapids and that was one of the top teams in the league and certainly earned him the opportunity for Steve Eiserman for seven years. I mean, let's not forget he was extended by Steve Eiserman. And now at this point, they're going in a different direction. Um, how, how serious a candidate did do you think Jeff Blashill might be, um, you know, outside of the guy that we've just talked about is maybe being number one in Rick Tockett. Yeah, Blaschel's interesting, right? He's also been linked to maybe joining, you know, originally it was Blaschel might be on the staff of Andrew Burnett if he stuck around in Florida. So uh, it's not a surprise. I mean, Jeff is a guy who has the great respect around the league. And, and the thing for the for the Jets and True North, they would have watched those Grand Rapids teams very closely as they were monitoring the Manitoba Moose. They would know the reputation that he was able to build uh, as a teacher and, a, you know, as a guy who was helpful in terms of development uh, down the road you know, in, in terms of earning that job with the Detroit Red Wings, uh, in terms of how far along they are with him or where he ranks in the rankings, I mean, that's a tough one to sort of predict us. But, I mean, Elliot Friedman, my colleague at Sportsnet, was just talking with Jeff Merrick on the on the show that it sounds like his, his candidacy is a legitimate one. I mean, you don't make the short list unless you have a legitimate chance. Now it's all about opportunity and fit and sort of see where things can go from there. But I don't have a ton of dealings with Jeff over the years. Definitely always sat in on his... Uh, pressers when we were in Detroit. I mean, obviously with all the Michigan connections on the Jets roster, uh, another very articulate guy, a smart guy, and probably a guy who will do a you know a better job in that next job, uh, provided the roster is in place for him. But uh, you know, known for you know again, he he did a nice job with some of those young players this year with Sider and Raymond and some of those guys who've kind of emerged, and obviously he's had an impact on Dylan Larkin's career to this point. So, uh, well respected guy, but. Would I put him at the top, near the top of the list? That I'm not sure about. I mean, he's also won. I mean, he won in the USHL. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. he won the Calder Cup in his first year in the American Hockey League. So, I mean, he does have somewhat of a resume, albeit probably not known to as many Winnipeg Jet fans as we speak here today. Um, so, I mean, Ken, obviously this is something. Oh, Jim Montgomery is an interesting name as well. And, I mean, we know that he's apparently been interviewing with the Winnipeg Jets, Jets and has been in the mix. Uh, we're also hearing that he could be a potential in Boston and, uh, you know, maybe sort of working both sides right now to see, uh, you know, what opportunities are there. 
Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, the former Dallas Stars uh, head coach and the assistant with the St. Louis Blues uh, has been busy on the interview front. Uh, as we've discussed, he had a solid interview with the Vegas Golden Knights uh, before they went with Bruce Cassidy. Uh, he has been, I think he was maybe also involved with Philadelphia. I'm not sure about that, but I think that he was involved in that process as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's a guy who's, you know, well respected for the job that he's done, you know, one at multiple levels as well, I believe, did a nice job in the USHL on his way up, you know, a college coach, did a great job there at Denver. Um, I mean, obviously the circumstances surrounding his departure were um, suboptimal, I guess, if you would say, but uh, Jim's worked hard at sort of getting, uh, getting, getting things in order on those fronts in his personal life and uh, is looking for that next opportunity. Uh, I think he's a very, you know, smart tactical coach. He's a good communicator as well. And and it'll be interesting. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, the Boston Bruins are getting very close to making their decision. Uh, David Quinn, the former Rangers coach, uh, I believe also very heavily involved in that process. Uh, Jay Pandolfo, I think, is another name that I've heard uh, in the mix there. And and we'll sort of see how it goes uh, on that front. But uh, a lot of coaches waiting patiently because of us, as we know, uh, there were a lot of chairs open not long ago. And most of those chairs are um, are are filled or are close to being filled. Yeah, and uh, you know, and I think many people, myself included, figured that you know, as soon as the cup was over, we'd probably see the likes of one of the Tampa assistants, uh, probably Derek Lalonde, potentially get that job yeah. in Detroit, and we're certainly hearing that as well. One more on that front, huh? Sorry, Jeff Halpern, also very much in the mix there. That was another name from the Stanley Cup final. Uh, he's very. Uh, very much respected in that uh, area and too. So he's, and sorry, Mike Bellucci is the other one in Boston, I think is the, is the fourth finalist there. So see um, where that goes. As far as the Jets goes, I mean, as far as you know, right now, I mean, are, are these second interviews? I mean, are, is the interviewing done? I mean, is right now a, both a decision-making and at some point negotiating with uh, whoever the top choice is over the course. And I, I guess, I mean, I would assume that if that is the case, it's highly likely that if it's not over the weekend, it's early next week, and the Winnipeg Jets head coach is going to be sitting at that table in Montreal on Thursday night. Yeah, I, I think it's trending that way, Huss. Uh, I, I do think that the second interviews have taken place um, in terms of, I don't know if there's been an offer presented. Uh, it's certainly possible that one has been presented, but uh, we're not sure on that part. Uh, I don't think it's, like I said, I think that in a perfect world, the Jets would love to have their head coach at the table for sure. I think it'd be a good opportunity for the organization to have that new voice available at that, you know, at on site in Montreal at a time where, you know, it's the first live draft in three years. Uh, I think there'd be an opportunity. They would like to have the ability to parade to that head coach and, you know, have some of that national attention on that selection. But I'm with you. I, I think it's more likely than not that the head coach will be in place, but I mean, it's always possible that they may have to wait before, but I think they'll it'll definitely be in place before a free agency. Uh, again, I'm not trying to sit on the fence here. I do think that they will have the coach in place early next week. But uh, if you know, if there's if much like with Barry Trotz, they're going to be as patient with their second choice as they were with the first. But it also won't last as long as that previous process took place. Well, if they're worried at all about national attention, they shouldn't be because I think everyone around the National Hockey League is looking at Winnipeg on uh, a number of big question marks. And you know, moving on from the head coaching search, we've got player personnel and potential trades. And, you know, we hadn't spent a lot of time talking about Pierre-Luc Dubois until, you know, the report from Elliot Friedman that, you know, the plan right now is to test unrestricted free agency in two years. Now, as we talked about, this is a long time, long time away. A lot of things can change over that period of time. You know, you could easily do a one-year deal, kick the can down the road, see what happens this year. Um, but it's not surprising <clears throat> that there have been trade rumors involving Dubois. Um, where is that situation at as far as you know? And, um, you know, what do you think the chances are that the Jets move more quickly on Dubois to get the maximum return for a player if they do think that they're not going to have him beyond two seasons from now. Yeah, that's for me. I mean, you know where I stand on the, uh, you know, asset management front. Uh, I think if you're constantly running on your, you're joining your team worried about two years down the road, why have a team? I mean, like, um, I love, and we were always looking to the future. It's part of our jobs, but you can't always lock everything down. The Jets have done a great job of locking the majority of their core down. Uh, we know, obviously, that with this trade being made for Patrick Laine, that they were, you know, getting Pierre-Luc Dubois in a long-term contract was the ultimate goal. Uh, the fact that that hasn't been realized after one or two seasons does not mean the Jets are going to have 
a panic move and just move on from Pierre-Luc Dubois. I'm not privy to the nature of the conversations and, and, and the, the fact that Dubois is even saying or his camp is saying that right now our plan is to test unrestricted free agency. That should surprise no one. I mean, <laughs> I'd say um, that too. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you say that? I mean, honestly, I mean, it, it's the beauty of like part of what makes the sport great, but I mean, you want to have some clarity before you're locking things down. I mean, is it, also, too, leaks happen from certain sides, maybe of teams who are interested in acquiring said player. I mean, let's not get, uh, you know, the, the bouncing ball or the cat chasing the string around. Uh, let's also remember how uh, the Jets have conducted business uh, so far. And history would suggest us um, that they have not gone into an offseason with someone two years away with unrestricted free agency and acted um, in a panic mode i mean yes patrick Liney was two years out when the trade happened but they didn't trade him in the summer right after the request was made or the suggestion that it would be best for both parties i mean pierre luc dubois is not soured on winnipeg i wrote that in my column today or yesterday and mm. like this doesn't mean he won't sign with the jets it's not to say that he is going to but he just wants to see how things emerge and huss as we know a lot can happen in a one-year span um, in terms of what what role a player is playing, I like just look at Dubois for an example. I mean, his first this time in Winnipeg, the first year did not go well. Then he became one of their best players in the in the second season. So, if that's the continued trajectory, I mean, I can tell you right now, my my most likely outcome here for Pierre Luc Dubois is that he signs a one year deal, either through arbitration or more likely through negotiation, and then we'll see how the year goes and. I just don't see the Jets making a move here and saying, um, "Yep, PLD, thanks for your service. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna rebuild now all of a sudden because the player isn't ready to commit uh, before July 13th." I mean, I just don't see that as a possibility. Do I see teams being interested in making calls and making offers? Sure. If you're the Jets and you're Kevin Cheveldayoff, you have to listen to the offers, but you're not going to take the offer B or C just to say you have clarity. Because you're going to need clarity on that next wave of guys you get in the trade anyway. So you can't constantly be worried. Of course, you're looking long term with this, but the Jets got to get things sorted out. They got to decide what's happening down the middle. Are you running it back with Shifley and Dubois? Are you moving one of them? I don't see a scenario where they move both of them. But I mean, we worked, we know how hard Kevin Chevaldeff worked to get that one two punch down the middle. It has not translated into immediate results. But, I mean, that's not to say that they're going to just burn burn the house down here, us. And I know a lot of people are talking about Colorado and Tampa. I mean, if they're even if they did decide to, to consider the rebuilding portion, I mean, what are you going to do with the guys that you have in place on long-term deals that you committed to winning to? And can you turn it over fast enough so that those players that are on those long-term deals, the Kyle Connors, the Josh Morrisseys, the... Um, the guys of that nature, I mean, Nikolai Ehlers, can you spin it around in a two to three year plan where you're actually going to be competitive? I mean, Colorado is a great example, Huss. Hale McCarr fell to them at four. They were the worst team in the NHL. They they lost the lottery. They finished fourth and they got the best player. That was a stroke of luck. That wasn't an automatic tank job that yielded the number one pick. The Jets are not going to be tanking. So do they need, they have big decisions on the horizon? Are the Rangers interested in one of or both of Shifley or Dubois? Absolutely. I mean, Frankie Gagnon's report, that's not a surprise at all. But for the Rangers, they got some cap concerns, us. So Shifley is probably more appealing on the short term because you have him at 6.125 and Dubois is going to cost north of eight. So, I mean, like you said, I mean, if you're if you're in the business of trying to improve a hockey club, you have to listen. And when the leaks happen, the price goes up. What have we been hearing? The offers haven't been good enough for Mark Shifley to this point. So now all of a sudden, you have an interested suitor in the Rangers that might also be interested in Dubois. Well, if you're the Montreal Canadiens, hypothetically, Huss, and you're interested in Pierre-Luc Dubois, and now you know there's another team that's making a solid offer, what do you think is going to happen to your offer if you're interested? Are you going to want to wait two years until he's a UFA potentially? I don't think so. but. Um, I mean, it's fun for all of us to talk about. I think Pierre-Luc Dubois is in the lineup in October, and we'll see uh, what happens from there. Well, and, and what's interesting, I know Frank earlier today, Frank Cervelli over at Daily Faceoff was saying, uh, you know, pretty emphatically that, you know, Mark Shifley is going to be back with the Winnipeg Jets. And 
you know, when I hear that from Frank, I, I can't help but think that's tied to the uncertainty of the Dubois situation. Um, if both of those guys are back, Ken, how different is this team even going to look next season? Well, that's a great question. But what I would what I would reiterate, though, is that if you believed originally in acquiring Dubois, that the team would be best served by having Mark Shifley and Pierre-Luc Dubois as your top two centers, I mean, that isn't suddenly... You, that isn't a bad idea, right? I mean, a lot of teams would love to have those two guys as their top two centers. Now, how the internal competition goes and how the ice time is allotted by the new head coach, now that would be something that we're all looking for in terms of what direction things are heading. But I said this to you from the beginning, and although it didn't sound like it at the podium on the day the season ended, I don't think Mark Shifley was necessarily demanding to be out. I think he wanted some changes to be made, and I think he could have used a little bit different wording in terms of how he expressed himself at the podium. But the fact that he wants things to be better, I mean, that I don't think that that's a surprise either. But I think the issue for most people was that there were there was not enough, you know, attention being paid to how he might part be want to be part of the solution um, rather than how it was going to be better for him as those an individual. Can those comments were uh, the lack of self-awareness in those comments still. I mean, when I think back, I somewhat have to chuckle for them and, and for all those things, Hey, we're going to have to see what the thing, where things go. Well, where have things gone? I mean, there's going to be a new coach as of right now. Right. That's it. Is that enough to have Mark Shifley come back with a with a good attitude and do what professional needs to do and commit himself to helping his team win? Because I think anyone that watched this, this certainly the second half of last season saw a player that wasn't entirely engaged in doing that. And that's a big reason why the Jets ended up in the situation that they are. I can't say it any other way. No, that's all. Uh, all that's fair, Huss. And I understand where you're coming from, but... I just think that the body of work is what we have to consider, right? I mean, the body of work the last season was not it was not good for Mark Shifley in terms of the engagement and, like you said, the awareness. Um, but there has probably been a lot of time for soul searching for Mark Shifley uh, going home. Uh, this guy didn't all of a sudden just start and forget that he loved hockey, right? I mean, this is the other part. Mark's been with this organization for a long time. Uh, he's shown a lot of good things. He's done a lot of good things for the organization. Um, last year, I don't think with the benefit of hindsight, I think he probably would have handled some things differently. Uh, Mark's got a lot of voices in terms of his support group around him. A lot of them are strong voices. Um, how he respond, like Mark's at a critical juncture of his career, Huss. This is how I would describe it. Um, Mark's got to decide if he wants to be a bona fide superstar or if he just wants to be a really good hockey player that puts up a lot of points. I mean, we always talk about what Mark is making. Well, you know what? You know how Nathan McKinnon's feeling right now? Exactly. He just got he just got to lift the trophy. He's making the same money as Mark Shifley. So to me, I think if you're Mark Shifley, you had a little bit of time to sort of reassess how the season went. I think Mark Shifley's going to come back with a better attitude, Huss, to be honest. I think Mark Shifley sees Nathan McKinnon, what he endured in his nine previous seasons, including the last three, and saw what it meant for him and also what it took for him to get the trophy. Having watched Nathan McKinnon so closely, Huss, everyone wondered why wasn't he producing more? He had the toughest matchups every night, and that included the defensive matchups of going against Connor McDavid. Um, he played really good hockey at times. He was getting like he 14 produce? shots on goal a night, man. Uh, like, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So this is the thing. If you're Mark Scheifele and you're back to loving hockey and watching hockey, you saw what Nathan McKinnon did, and I have to think that he is going to make that same commitment to get towards his next goal. And if he does that, us, he's going to get paid in the next contract the way that he's wanted to this whole time. But um, like I said, it, it's super interesting. And, you know, we're not talking to players in the off season or know where their heads are at, but um, I'll be surprised if we don't see a highly engaged Mark Shifley uh, come October. And, you know, as Frank mentioned, most signs are pointing towards him being in Winnipeg again. And, you know, if that's the case, then I think Mark's going to take it upon himself to get back to being a leader, which was what he was before he had this sort of dip in his play, in the two-way play. Is this sort of the reason, um, all of what you just said, part of the reason why we're now hearing that, you know, Blake Wheeler might be on the way out? I think that's fair. I think it's probably part of it. I mean, we know that it's a difficult um, trade to make, perhaps. Um, you know, with the news about Anthony Duclair, there's a lot of people playing connect the dots with the Florida Panthers. 
Um, is that a possibility? Sure. Uh, I think this is where the creativity comes in, right? Like Florida probably wants to move Bobrovsky's contract. They're going to need some offense with Duclair being out. Um, I, I don't know that there's a, we talked about the potential for three-way deals last week. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that looks like or what the retention is How do you or get whatever Bob else. Bob to agree to leave. Bob's got a full no move. He's making oh, no, 10 no, mil one of the best teams. Like I just don't know how they right. go and convince him that it's in his best interest to leave right now. That was part of what he negotiated oh, when sure. he got that deal. For sure, but if you're Bob and you want to be the starter and Paul Maurice tells you that I'm going with Spencer Knight and you're going to roll as the backup uh, playing 25, 30 games, that also probably is not as appealing to Sergei Bobrovsky, right? So... Uh, I don't know. There, there's what, what the other thing that I heard around the Stanley Cup final. Um, the New Jersey Devils are definitely interested in upgrading the goaltending position. It was a tough year for Mackenzie Blackwood, uh, you know, starting with the COVID stuff and everything else, the vaccine, whatever. Um, they look like an organization that would be looking for goaltending and they want to expedite their process of being competitive. So, is there a fit? They also have cap money with PK's money coming off the books. Is there a way to work a three way deal that way? I'm not sure, but. Uh, what I do know, it's going to be interesting times. I mean, I know a lot of people are saying, well, well, if Trotz isn't there, there weren't going to be many changes. They were going to roll with the core. I still think the Jets are going to make a, a, a move with one of their foundational pieces. And they also have to sort out the defense situation. Uh, Brandon Dillon is a guy that we know generated a lot of interest at the trade deadline. Um, could he be a guy that's on the move potentially? I think that's definitely a guy whose name we're going to be hearing about in the weeks leading up to the uh, draft and the end of free agency. I've said this before. I think Brendan Dillon is a guy who brings tremendous value to the Winnipeg Jets. He plays a certain style that they don't have a lot of on the back end, but he's going to be in demand. How high in demand and what those offers are like, um, that I'm not sure yet. And I'm not saying that he's the guy that's going to be going, but I know he's going to be garnering interest, much like Pierre-Luc Dubois and Mark Shifley previously have garnered interest. And I do think that, again, we don't know for sure that the Jets and Wheeler have reached the point of no return, but if they are looking for a change of scenery, um, I mean, then sure. I mean, if you're the Jets and you move Wheeler, maybe you want to see what it's like with Mark. But I mean, those two guys were great together for a long time, but I mean, you'd also might be curious more to see what they were like apart because us, when they split the lines, both parties actually benefited at times. Wheeler shining with the, uh, you know, with Dubois, and at times Ehlers and Shifley playing very well together. So it, it's an important time. And here's the thing: you don't get a do-over if you're Kevin Chevalier. Off. There's no mulligans here. So if you're making moves involving any of those players, you better get them right, or this whole process. Uh, is going to become a little bit more challenging. Well, and, and you speak about the pressure on Chevy. I mean, when making these moves, um, you know, you're, to use a golf reference, I mean, <laughs> this is he's on the back nine right now of this round, and the 18th hole is next Thursday with round yeah. number one of the NHL draft. Um, I mean, could we be talking about a very quiet week for the Winnipeg Jets next year outside of the hiring of a coach? Or, or are you still uh, of the opinion that, you know, there will be some player movement and far more likely it to happen next week, considering when most of the trades do happen in around the off season going into round one. Yeah. And so let's just say this, Kevin Chevaldeoff's coming up to a par five that is reachable perhaps, but there's a <laughs> lot, there's a lot of water and hazards around the, around the, around the T around the green. I'm not sure he's taking out the three wood from 275 right now. I think he's going to be hitting a layup to a hundred yards and then trying to dial in that wedge play right at the flag. So uh, I do think that the jets are going to make a move. I think the fact that they have that second first round pick at number 30 is very interesting. And we also know with the draft order being released and, and Mark Hillier speaking to the jets podcast about them taking the pick that originally belonged to the blues this year at 55, it gives them some versatility to kind of, move maybe up or down depending on what their list is looking like but us we know this is the case i mean what what are teams looking for upgrades on defense right so the jets have a surplus of defensemen it's hard to envision a scenario where some of that surplus is not being moved to get offensive players that can help them right i mean this is something that it's sort of a match but now you got to find the match for which team you're sort of honing in on and which players you might be able to extract in a move of that nature. So that goes back to your point about the coaching. 
how does the new head coach feel about Billy Hainala or how does he feel about Dylan Sandberg or how does he feel about Declan Chisholm if he's a guy who's been watching the American League? Um, all of those things will factor into the decisions that are being made. But I still don't. I mean, we say this every year. It's the most important offseason since the team relocated. Plus, there's no other way to look at it this year. I mean, whether it's at the box office or on the ice, the Jets need to take a step forward after taking a significant step backward last year. So to me, it doesn't mean blow it up, burn it down. It means make a couple of strategic moves that can improve the roster and get back to being competitive because guess what? The Central Division just got tougher, and now the Stanley Cup champs reside in it. And sure, they have nine unrestricted free agents they got to take care of. Their core is locked down with the Conn Smythe Trophy winner and the aforementioned Nathan McKinnon. And they're going to be a beast for years to come, much like the Chicago Blackhawks were when the Jets were coming back into the league. So the cream of the crop and the gold standard resides in the Central. So if you want to be competitive with those teams, you're going to have to make some moves to get yourself to that point. Yeah, no doubt. <clears throat> well, I mean, hey, they need to make some moves just to get back into the mix. Sure. I mean, based on last season. I mean, before we start talking about going toe-to-toe -to -toe <laughs> with the Colorado Avalanche. Hey, before we go, you mentioned Billy Hainala. I am of the opinion, and I know that he's been his name has been thrown out. I don't think for a second that that's an asset you give up to get Blake Wheeler off the books. I'll say that right now. And I also think that considering the way this team has and will continue to be built – with draft and develop, regardless of how you felt that he's been handled over the last couple of years. I personally don't think that there's any chance that the Winnipeg Jets punt on Billy Hainala and move him before he gets a legitimate, consistent opportunity to be a regular in the National Hockey League. Am I wrong? Find room for him in the top four is my, you know, Kevin Cheveldayoff doesn't need my advice, but my advice to the Jets is find room for Billy Hainala in the top four this year. Find him a partner that you feel is a stabilizer for him, whether that's Nate Schmidt or Dylan DeMello or whoever you want to roll with in that situation. I think Hanela is part of the solution, Huss. I agree with you. I think he's had a lot of great experience, and some of it he probably didn't appreciate at the time. But I think Billy Hanela is ready to be an impact player at the next level. And I'm not saying he's going to win the Calder Trophy, but this is a guy that can help the Jets in the areas where they struggled. And I don't mean – I mean – not by doing the defending portion necessarily, but his ability to move. Having watched Kale McCarr now, Huss, for a month straight, and I'm not saying Billy Hanel is Kale McCarr, but if you can move and get involved in the play with your feet and also use your feet and stick to defend, you can have a big impact on the hockey game. And I think that Billy Hanel, once he gets to the point where he's ready to become a regular, and I think that time is now, he can be an impactful player for the Winnipeg Jets. He can help stabilize a defense core that has been in flux. And I think he's a guy that the Jets should be building around, not moving out in order to try to upgrade in other areas. I'm with you 100% on that. Weber, this has been uh, this has been awesome. I mean, uh, we could kick it around for another hour, frankly, <laughs> with everything going on around this hockey team. But uh, fingers crossed you won't get called off the golf course in the middle of uh, – an ace round on the weekend to uh, uh, judge on everything. But I do think that, you know, we'll have some interesting conversations next week and we will have some news certainly on the coaching front and um, possibly some significant player movement um, heading into the draft round one Montreal on Thursday night. Have a great one. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Have an awesome long weekend. And uh, last one, it was awesome to be inside the Rogers Center to see the Vladdy Guerrero Jr. walk off the other way. And my uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Uh, I did enjoy some of the uh, mayhem at Pearson International Airport, but did make it home safely after checking out uh, the Jays game. It was uh, excellent. Always good to soak in those events. We love to love to go to Huss and uh, can't wait till we're at one together, whether it's a gold eyes game or over at IG field or whatever we decide to, uh, whatever we decide to do. Well, now you're back. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time and let's make a point <laughs> of doing that real soon. Ken, thanks for doing this. We'll catch up real soon. Cheers, my friend. All right. Good stuff with Weaver. Thanks to Ken as always. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to Ken and the rest of the fellas next week. Uh, as we discussed, uh, lot is ex a lot is expected. A new head coach, and uh, we'll see what happens when it comes to the moves of the uh, general manager, Kevin Chevalier. All right, Rewiki's on deck. Uh, big thanks to our friends at Culligan Water. 
Great sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk since we got going. Family-owned Winnipeg business, 65 years in the game as the go-to folks for all things water. Softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, and drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Whether it's for the home, the cottage, or the office, Culligan has you covered. They're at 1200 Sargent Avenue. 694-5180 or hit them up online at drinkculligan.com. Hey, the long weekend is just about here, but you still have time. Did you get your batteries? Is your boat ready to go? The sea do that golf cart going to be ripping around in the uh, in the campgrounds? Well, if the answer is no, um, get on down to Manitoba Battery right now. In fact, give them a call at 783-8787. Let them know what you need, and you'll be able to take advantage of some extended hours for spring and summer up until 8 p.m. So you're not wasting time on the weekend doing things that you could have done during the week. And the bottom line is going to Manitoba Battery, you're shopping local, and you're getting the best prices in town and saving time and money as opposed to dealing with the big box stores, not to mention you'll have the great staff that Donnie's got over at Manitoba Battery to take care of everything you need. Pop down and see him, 1026 Logan Avenue, and online at manitobabattery.com. Well, hey, with the long weekend here, uh, a great time to pop into Royal Sports tonight before maybe you get out of the city. Uh, obviously, Royal is the spot for all of your jersey needs. It's the greatest store when it comes to uh, sports fans, merchandise, NHL, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, soccer. Uh, but for people that are going to be getting outside and having some fun, that's also the first stop. Um, an expanded fitness section, all the great shoes and activewear, but an expanded soccer section, softball, baseball, bikes, and if you haven't tried disc golf, pop on down, check out their huge disc golf section, and maybe bang some chains this weekend. Uh, Royal Sports is your number one sports superstore in the peg, renowned worldwide. Pop down and see them, 750 Pemina Highway. And you could also get them, uh, it's, follow them on Instagram, actually, at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information, including some upcoming world-famous tent sales. And hey, just before we bring Brandon in, uh, the John Deere Classic is on right now. Far from a, a star-studded field um, in the field this week on the PGA Tour, but a great opportunity for Adam Hadwin, who was the uh, betting favorite along with Webb Simpson heading in. Hadwin is even through seven holes today, right up at the top of the list. It's J, uh, JT Poston with a 62 nine under par. He's got a three shot lead on Vaughn Taylor and Ricky Barnes. And of course, the first live event in Portland gets underway today. I'm not too sure what time the shotgun start was on, but uh, maybe when you're done watching us on YouTube, you can fire up and see what Brooks and DeChambeau and uh, Phil are doing over on uh, the Live Tour as well. Of course, Breezy Bend, our great golf sponsor. Um, great spot for you and your family to make a permanent home at one of Winnipeg's finest private clubs with an amazing junior program, women's program, and so much more. Give them a call. Corey Johnson will fill you in on the waiting list and what's to come for Breezy Bend. And, of course, you can check out everything they've got going over at Breezy Bend. .ca. All right, let's continue the hockey talk. We will talk Bombers. Ed Tate coming up a little later on. And we'll also have a marble race, which we normally do on Fridays. By the way, if you're new here, folks, make sure to stick around for the marble race. Great chance to win a Winnipeg Sports Talk hoodie. And uh, just make sure you're subscribed. If you haven't already, hit that red subscribe button. Great crew in here. And uh, it continues to grow daily here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right. Speaking of talking sports in the peg, let's welcome in our good friend, Brandon Rowicki, the host of Skates and Plates, coming to us from parts unknown heading into the weekend. Rue, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing good, man. This is actually a live image. Everyone's seen. I'm just, I'm practicing my ventriloquy. So my mouth won't move, but this is a live streamed image right now. Yeah, you're, you're looking good. It's great to get away. And uh, of course, you and uh, the fam, uh, everyone wants to get out of the city for a little bit, but we appreciate you taking the time to join us. I know you've got a new Skates and Plates episode dropping late tonight or tomorrow morning just before we do anything folks make sure wherever you're getting the winnipeg sports talk podcast you poke in skates and plates and make sure to check out all of brandon's winnipeg jets content um b let's talk about it you know we've heard the names rick tockett jim montgomery scott arneal 
Pascal Vincent, and now former Red Wings coach Jeff Blaschel. Um, what do you make of the five names that seem to be reported as the last men standing? And uh, what are your thoughts on the Jets' decisions going into this weekend and into next week? You know, I, I like two of the names. I like two of the names more than the rest, certainly. Um, I, I would be fine with Jim Montgomery. For for me, he was actually probably my my second choice after Barry Trotz and, and Bruce Cassidy uh, went their separate ways. But even Pascal Vincent wouldn't be too bad of a plan B, plan C, right? I mean, it's especially after you watch the the Stanley Cup Finals and argue, not arguably, the two best teams in the sport going toe-to-toe and, and kind of setting setting a new baseline of elevated play that, that, that's going to be really difficult for a lot of teams to reach. You know, both their coaches were first-time head coaches. And if Pascal Vincent or Vincent, that would be the best part of him being hired is I can figure out how to say his last name. But if he's brought on board, then you know what? That's not too bad of a path to follow in going down the avalanche and the lightning's footsteps there. As, as far as the other ones, you know, I, I think most people in Winnipeg are the most hesitant on Scott Arneal. I mean, it just it's been over 10 years since he's been a head coach of the NHL, and, and even that was a pretty brief stint. I'm I'm not a super big Rick Tockett fan either, just because he's had such limited or a lack of success coaching at the NHL level. But for me, you try to succeed in Arizona, Brandon. Yeah, I mean that, that's fair. That, that is fair. I mean, Dave Tippett did it. I mean, it didn't work out for him too well at Edmonton. But having said that, like for me, it's it's definitely Montgomery or Vincent. I was actually kind of a big fan of of a dark horse in in Mike Vellucci, but doesn't look like that's going to be the case here in Winnipeg. Not, I mean, Flash Hill is kind of mad for me, but Montgomery or Vincent would be, like I mentioned, a pretty good Plan B option after Barry Trotz left. The, the, the name Blaschel is really interesting, and it hadn't been one that I think had really been considered by most people. We hadn't heard it until recently, but it's interesting to hear Elliot Friedman say that he is a serious candidate for the Winnipeg Jets job. And you're going through his coaching career. He won in the United States Hockey League. He won a Calder Cup in his first year with Grand Rapids and then ended up you know, ascending to the head coach of the Detroit Red Wings. And when he had better players, made the playoffs, won 41 games in their first year, and then was sort of tasked with overseeing this rebuild that, you know, was essentially a bigger, uh, a tank. Um, it, the Blaschel situation, I mean, if he was the head coach, I mean, how different of a situation do you think he has in Winnipeg? And, and let me ask you this, I guess, if Blaschel was the guy, does that indicate maybe a different direction in your mind of the franchise going a bit younger and maybe having some more moves or is it just this is a guy that, you know, did what he had to do for Steve Eiserman? There was a reason why he was there as long as he was. And now he's ready to go into a different situation and try and win games as opposed to just handle young players and develop while they wait. Yeah, I know what you mean, because a lot of people have brought up the possibility that, you know, Barry Trotz was maybe brought in to be a win now coach. And now that he's not here, maybe like a rebuild reload is in the offings for the Winnipeg Jets this upcoming year. And I, I really don't see it that way. And if anything, in, in Trotz's kind of statement to NHL.com, he mentioned in there a line that I think a lot of people might have passed over, but he mentioned how impressed he was with Mark Chipman's commitment to winning and winning right away. And that to me speaks to a team that's not going to be in the Connor Bedard sweepstakes, at least willingly going into this season. I, I think the Jets are they're certainly going to make a ton of moves. It's going to be a much different team this year, but I don't think they're going into this campaign with the plan of missing the playoffs and getting a high draft pick. So for me, I'm just going out there and hiring the best coach that's available. And, and to be honest, in today's NHL, developing and, and working with young talent is, is mandatory. It, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going in one direction or the other if you're a team going into the season for me it's just you've got to work with young people because with the way the cap is and and the way the nhl is trending younger and younger if you're unable to do that you're not going to be a coach of the nhl for very long you know I, i'm to me talk it's so interesting and and i guess it just comes back to some of the issues that you know many of us believe the jets had sort of a fractured locker room um you know players some players that just didn't buy in to what Dave Lowry was tasked with doing in the second half of the season or since Paul uh, Paul Maurice walked away. And 
The one thing about Talkin, I think, opposed to everybody else, is the fact that he had his great playing career. I mean, he has done so much. He's played with the best in the world, and he has some coaching experience. I don't think really the media experience has anything to do with, you know, any effect on the club. Um, but if they are trying to win now with the majority of this group, does the stroke that a talk it has walking into the room, not quite at a trots level, but similar in a ways, um, sort of give us an indication of the direction that the team is going? I I don't think so. I I, I really don't. And even you know when you when you talk about somebody like Pascal Vincent possibly coming in right now, I mean. The Edmonton Oilers brought in an AHL coach that hadn't gotten a taste at the NHL level, and it worked out pretty good for them, right? I, I think there's, and funny enough, the Flyers went down this route. I, I think there's a bit of a misconception that if you want to be a nasty, more difficult team to play against than you were the year before, you need to hire a veteran coach to find a way to do that. And I, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, so I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't be hiring Rick Tockett just because I would want the Jets to be, you know, similar to how he played when when he was in the NHL. You, you kind of forget with how tough he was that the guy was almost a 50 goal scorer for a number of seasons. But I, I would just be looking to find the guy that would be able to instill structure and accountability while at the same time allowing for some offensive freedom. If it's Rick Tockett, that's great. If it's Pascal Vincent, that's fine with me. If it's Jim Montgomery, I'm, I'm cool with that too. I, I guess I have a little more doubts about Rick Tockett, even though he wasn't dealt the best hand in his previous stints, whereas you know Montgomery showed that he could get the most out of a Dallas Stars team. And while Vincent hasn't had a shot at the NHL level just yet, his AHL work has been phenomenal. And I'm always a little more apt to give a first-time coach a chance because it seems like that's where a lot of these these big time coaches you get a shot like that for the first time and you don't give it away and we could see him be the head coach here in Winnipeg for maybe half a decade or more. Well, you make a great point, and I think anyone that was paying attention to the Stanley Cup final, I mean, has to realize that both John Cooper and Jared Bednar were first time coaches that went through some rough times and then, of course, ascended to uh, the top of the mountain in the National Hockey League. You know, I want to talk a bit more about your thoughts on Pascal Vincent because, you know, fair or unfair, and frankly, I think it's somewhat unfair, he and Scott Arneal to a big portion of the fan base have an X over their names before they're even considered because of the fact that they do have ties to the organization and the city. Um, but I'm sort of with you. I thought Pascal did great work with the Manitoba Moose. And I think the fact that he got away from the organization and wasn't here for the last couple of years um, is probably a benefit as well. Um, what attracts you about Pascal Vincent? And uh, why, if it's not Montgomery, do you think that he would be a good fit? And how do you think that would work, at least in the short term, um, you know, trying to get this thing back on track quickly in the Central Division? So so it's funny because it, it, in a way, none of us really know, right? Like when, you, when you're talking about a first-time head coach, everybody, oh, I like this, I like this. But nobody really knows until it happens. I love Dave Hagstall as the Flyers coach. And then, you know, eight months later, it's, oh, God, what have we done here? We've made a huge mistake. But, you know, when he was coaching the Moose and, and watching them play live and in person a few times, I, I just love the way they played as a team. Like they were just they were they were fun to watch. They almost in a way reminded me of the Boston Bruins a little bit at times with how well they played as a five man unit. And and hearing the way he communicates in interviews, and I know that's not the best way to to, to tab a head coach, but he seems like he speaks really well. He seems like he's able to reach youngsters and 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 speak their language and connect with them, which is a really, really difficult thing to do and, and something that's mandatory, as I mentioned earlier in the NHL nowadays. And I, I like the fact, too, that, like, sure, he was, you know, originally a true North hire, but he was also highly coveted by a number of teams for coach, head coaching searches the past two years. He, like, he got interviews for, for a number of different teams. It's not just, you know, the Winnipeg Jets that were interested in him. He's a pretty highly regarded name across the NHL. So I, you know, I had my doubts about the Winnipeg Jets trying to lean too much into the local connections. But to me, I can make an exception for Pascal Vincent, especially because, you know, he he did head elsewhere for these past two seasons. If anything, that, that I could see that as a bit of a positive here, that he can kind of bring in some some outside views that he saw while working with 
the Blue Jackets and whichever other teams he was working with in the past year. I I I think he's one of these up and coming coaches that when given a shot, he's, he's going to show that he probably should have gotten the shot a few years earlier. Uh, Brandon Rewick, he's with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily discussing the many decisions and uh, moves that the Winnipeg Jets will be facing over the course of this next little bit. Uh, just, I guess just one more on the coaching segment, and, and maybe this de- de- deals with Pascal. A guy that has been in that dressing room that knows a good percentage of the players uh, I- I- in many cases would be thought of as a positive. Um in this case, I'm not sure that it is. If he was hired, how significant do you think the player moves or the changes, especially to the leadership core, uh, or the need to change that increases as opposed to a guy like a Tockett or a Montgomery with absolutely no connection to anyone currently on the roster? I I don't think it it changes anything at all. I, I think if anything, I think Barry Trotz being the head coach could have potentially swayed management to go in a different direction because he would have been given a, a fair amount of pull. And, you know, maybe he's Barry Trotz would be thinking, I want this guy here, even though management is thinking about kind of starting with the fresh slate. To me, it really doesn't matter which of the the f- four or five options are brought in here. To me, the Jets have, I, I believe at least, made their intentions pretty clear on on which direction they want to go in. And I I don't anticipate whoever's brought in here to change the fact that we're going to see a few big names shipped out of here in Winnipeg in you know, maybe just a few days time. Well, let's get to that. And it'll be a little bit of a tease. I know your episode of skates and plates tomorrow. will uh, discuss quite a bit, but um, player movement overall, um, you know, it's interesting to hear Frank Saravelli to say pretty emphatically that he doesn't believe Mark Scheifele is going anywhere and he'll be part of the, uh, the club next year. I would have to think that that does have some, connection to the uncertainty about Pierre-Luc Dubois' future here. And then there is the captain, Blake Wheeler, who uh, has emerged as uh, a, a high number on Frank's trade bait board. Um, who do you expect to go, and what do you expect to happen this week heading into the draft, Brandon? Because as we all know, a good portion of significant deals are made heading into the draft. Yeah, I, I got to be honest. I uh, Unless... Unless some extremely, extremely high-end name is coming back the other way, I do not understand the Pierre-Luc Dubois trade talk whatsoever. I, I just don't I don't see why the Jets need to be rushed into making a decision on that right now. I, I, I just, I really don't get it. And, you know, there's been some talk, and I know Weber had an article that came out yesterday or, or two days ago talking about, you know, maybe Philip Cheadle with the Rangers, maybe Lafreniere. I mean, Lafreniere would be kind of intriguing, but I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm not willing to give up on Pierre Luc Dubois just because he says that in two years from now he plans on testing free agency. That's a long, long time away from that, and I'm not, I'm not ready to to part ways with a six four giant down the middle just because, you know, he might not be over the moon enthused with the direction the team is at right now. So, I mean, that that's the first part is that. I, I, I would hate to see him go unless it's for an extremely high-end piece down the middle coming back the other way. I mean, if I had to make a prediction right now, uh, I, I know some people are saying Shifley is going to be in the mix next year. I, you know, just with with Blake Wheeler being put on the trade bait board by Frank Saravalli, apparently gauging trade interest around the league, for me, it's it's kind of a package deal. And I, if I had to make a guess, I, I do think that we see both Shifley and Wheeler in different locations next year. Um, I probably feel a little more confident about that for Blake Wheeler than I do about Mark Shifley right now. But I I don't know, man. I just, I can't, I, I know, I know emotions were running high at the end of this past year and, and maybe, maybe things have cooled off a little bit on the player front, but I, I just don't know how you can listen to what Paul Stasny said and then throw in Ehlers, Connor, Pionk, the rest of the team. And say, yeah, you know what? This is this is going to be okay to have a reunion of basically the same guys next year, and including Mark Shifley. Like to me, that was just the point of no return. And I'd be much more willing to talk with the Rangers about Mark Shifley than I would about Pierre Luc Dubois right now. The intriguing part with Wheeler for me is going to be whether it's if he is eventually moved on, if it's going to be a trade, or if the Jets are desperate enough to go the buyout route instead. Uh, the buyout's not extremely punitive. That, that might even be the better route because at least that way you don't have to give up a sweetener 
either a pick or a prospect for a team to take on Wheeler's eight plus million dollar salary. Do you but, think for a second? Um, I mean, the, the one if, thing. If I had, let, let me just say on that. I mean, I guess if you're expecting someone to take the entire eight point one two five or eight point five, whatever the number is this year, um, on the cap, maybe there is something that you have to give back to get that off. But man, you're losing a very effective player now. I mean, that is kind of removing all of the culture issues, and um, you know the uh, the fact that he was the captain has basically ran this locker room. And I think there definitely is the need for maybe a fresh start amongst that group that allows some of the other young players that are ready to take the greater leadership roles there. But if the Jets were willing to eat, say, fifty percent of the salary, and you're getting Blake Wheeler for four and change for the next couple of years. Um, I think you're actually getting a half decent return for that. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough to say, right? Because you don't know how valued he is around the NHL, right? Because this previous offseason, just looking at comparables of of guys with big salaries that have been traded in the past, and there's very few of them, by the way. I think there's only six six guys in the salary cap era that have been traded that have had a cap hit of over eight million dollars. But Jake Voracek was traded by the Flyers to Columbus last year, and it was a one-for-one swap with Cam Atkinson. And Voracek, conveniently enough, has the same cap hit as Blake Wheeler. And Atkinson, I believe, makes something around $5.8 million. Um, one more year on Atkinson's deal than, uh, than Voracek's. So, I mean, could that potentially be, you know, a route the Winnipeg Jets could go down? You know what I mean? Like, it's... It's, it's you're not giving up a, a sweetener or anything like that, but you're taking on a team's not necessarily a bad contract, but one that they they wouldn't be too upset about parting over. Maybe that's the route we see the Jets go in a potential Blake Wheeler trade. I mean, the fact is they're going to have to take salary back either way, unless it's Wheeler shipped to Arizona and Buffalo, and I, I don't see him waving the NMC for that. But, you know, New Jersey and the Islanders do make a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, New Jersey has a ton of cap space and they're looking to make a bit of a splash this off season. And you wonder if a Wheeler Tatar swap could be something that works for both sides. And then we know Lou loves his vets. Lou loves his old guys and, and maybe Josh Bailey or a Kyle Paul Mary, both players making $5 million per year. Maybe, maybe like when you're just trying to find comparables and how things have worked in the past, Maybe that could be a route the Winnipeg Jets go is, you know what, they're not paying somebody $8 million on their cap, but they're getting a slightly lesser player, but a little more cap flexibility. And that might be the better way to go to kind of kickstart this new slate. Hey, Brandon, when you read the room um, of uh, the everything going on around this team uh, going into next week and the draft, do you think it's more likely that a defenseman or two are moved next week, or might it be the way the Jets did the couple of days leading into free agency or in and around free agency, considering what is on the open market that teams can get simply for cap space? Well, the good thing is the defensive free agent market stinks. It's awful. So if you're if you're looking to get somebody at a pretty reasonable deal, yeah, the Winnipeg Jets could probably help you out. I, w- I would think it would happen... I would think it would happen around the draft. I, I would imagine at least, you know, especially probably more so Brendan Dillon than the Nate Schmidt. The the Schmidt deal would be a little more complex if that was even able to happen. Um, but I mean, there's pr- pretty much any team of the NHL could fit Brendan Dillon in at what is it? 3.9, something like that uh, to be a four or a five on their team. And it probably only cost you, I don't know, a second or a third round pick, something, something along those lines. That, to me, is a trade that I could imagine happening leading up to the draft. If it was to be someone like Nate Schmidt moved out, that, to me, would be a little later on in the season. What what would be most intriguing for me is do the Winnipeg Jets try to go and do a little big game hunting themselves on, on the blue line market? Because that, to me, that was, I, I know the, the speed and the skill of the Lightning and the Avalanche is what really jumps out to you from watching that series. But the big thing that stood out to me is if you don't got a stud number one defenseman, you don't have a chance against some of these teams. Like you need, and, and as great as Morrissey was last year, imagine this Jets blue line. If you can bring somebody in that is at another level over what Morrissey gave you last year, the team would be in a really, really strong position 
And I just don't know with the way the NHL is trending towards nowadays, if you can't make it into a deep playoff run without somebody like that on your back end. So that's something that I don't know who that would be, but that's what I'm most intrigued by what the Winnipeg Jets could do when it comes to the when it comes to the defenseman on their club. Hey, Brandon Rewicki's with us live on location from parts unknown heading into the long weekend. Uh, listen, we're going to get to some football with Eddie Tate in a minute, but just on the way out, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, what did you think of the Kevin Fiala deal going to L.A.? And what, if you read the room with the potential of Philip Forsberg leaving Nashville as an unrestricted free agent and the cap squeeze that the Minnesota Wild are going to be in for the next three seasons, um, what's your thoughts on the landscape of the Central Division, Stanley Cup champions at the top of the list notwithstanding, as to how realistic the Winnipeg Jets could have a quick turnaround based on what happens over the course of this next little while and be back in the mix where a lot of people thought they'd be last season, which certainly was a playoff team. <laughs> you know, there, there's a chance that they don't do a whole lot this offseason and they're the third best team in the division next year, right? Like, <laughs> you look around and the division, the just like the defensive free agent market, it stinks. It's not a good division anymore. It's not the bloodbath of, you know, four or five years ago. I mean, Colorado is terrifying, and that that part sucks. But after St. Louis, yeah, like so many question marks. I mean, Minnesota will be good, but I don't think they'll be anywhere near as good as they were last season. Uh, Nashville, with without Philip Forsberg, and, and can Duchesne and Johansson have a similar season as they did last year? I mean, there's a ton of question marks about wh- wh- just who the Predators are and what they're going to be next year. But Chicago and Arizona aren't even trying to be competitive. And Dallas is old as hell. So like, just by default, the Winnipeg Jets find themselves in that 3-4 spot right now behind Colorado and St. Louis. So it's, you know, that that's why in a way there's been so much talk about, oh, the Jets need to rebuild. Oh, they need to reload. This, 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 this. But in, in, a, in a really poor division that's, that's top heavy right now, you know, you can find yourself at at the very least in that three spot without making a ton of major moves. But if the Jets go out there and and find a way to to retool on the fly this offseason, there's there's no reason for me why they can't be the second best team in this division going into next year. And and who knows, right? It's it's tough. <laughs> Lightning aside, it's tough to go back to back and go deep in the playoffs after winning the Stanley Cup. The year prior, so the division the Jets find themselves in, it's it's pretty crazy. You know, only only a couple of years ago we were talking about how how awful the Central is, and now, you know what, the the, the Pacific and the Central have kind of switched places pretty quickly here. The Jets are pretty fortunate to find themselves in the Central right now. No, it's a, it, it, it's a, the, the landscape of the division certainly is changing right now, and it uh, just adds even more intrigue to what will happen over the course of this next week and the next couple months heading into training camp. Brandon, great having you on the program. Have an awesome weekend. Just before we go, uh, give a quick plug for uh, what you're dropping on skates and plates tomorrow. Yeah, no, thanks. Thank, and thanks for plugging as well. But uh, it'll be a Blake Wheeler trade talk episode. So we'll mention, you know, we kind of gave a little bit of a tease there, but just where he could go, who could be in the mix, should he, all, all, all that stuff. We'll get into all that. And then obviously Tuesday, there's there's going to be there's going to be some stuff that goes down over the weekend. So we'll get to that uh, in our episodes next week. But appreciate you having me on, man, and and dealing with the the issues that come with being in, in Bigfoot country out here. So it's it's the perfect way for me to head into the week. It is chatting with you. Hey, Ben, ben uh, go crack a cold one. Have a great long weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, man. Talk soon. There it is. Skates and plates drops tomorrow morning. So subscribe wherever you get your podcast. All right. Eddie Tate coming up. We're going to get the latest on the bombers just before we do that. Oh, man, I had a great time at Assiniboia Downs last night. we got to wait until live racing is back on Monday. But, uh, yes, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Assiniboia Downs, the place to be. Remus and I will get back with our picks next week. And congratulations again to the winners from our pick six contest the last couple weeks. We'll look forward to hosting you guys all at Assiniboia Downs on July the 12th. And, uh, uh, of course, a big thanks to the gang at Not Auto Corp. Went with Trevor and a bunch of the folks from Not yesterday. Had a great time out of the track. Of course, Not is ready right now for a big weekend. If you are in the city and you're thinking about a new vehicle, before you go anywhere, pop on down to Not. 
Why not get in the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Knot team? And I did get a little uh, note that they're also hiring right now. So if you do uh, like working with cool cars, whether it's on the, the detailing side, the automotive side, definitely check in to the, what's going on over at Knot Auto Corp. Uh, got a couple of great tweets from some folks out in Dauphin's first beer of country fest, cracking an ice cold 1919. I'm going to be heading out there and hopefully doing the same tomorrow with a couple pals. Uh, but wherever you're spending the long weekend, Little Brown Jug will make it that much better. And, hey, by the way, you've still got until tomorrow night at 11 to win those Folk Fest passes, four-day passes. Um, all you need to do is pop on down to the uh, brewery and tap room on William Avenue or order online for pickup and purchase a 24-pack of Folk Fest lager to automatically be entered uh, the lucky winner will be drawn and contacted on July 2nd. Again, Little Brown Jug down on William Avenue and online at littlebrownjug.ca. And just about to get to a Princess Auto Bomber report with our guy Ed Tate. Of course, Princess Auto, proud sponsors of the Bombers. And the folks that will be putting on the tailgate party before the next Bomber home game on July 15th. Head on out early for uh, discounted beers, hot dogs, pop, entertainment, prizes as well outside of the stadium beginning a couple hours before game time brought to you by our friends at princess auto proud sponsors of the bombers and the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at princess auto visit them panet road or portage avenue west and shop online 24 7 365 Weird weekend for the weird week for the bombers. Sort of had their long weekend already, and now it's back to work, getting ready for Monday night football in the six on Monday against the Toronto Argonauts. Let's bring in our guy Eddie Tate for the latest on the blue and gold. Ed, what's going on? How are you? Not too bad, Andrew. How are you, man? I'm um, great. You know, we've had lots to talk about this week, although it's been a little quiet on the bomber front at three and zero because, of course, they're just back at practice today. But hey, just quickly before we get to the bombers. I had the pleasure last week, of course, of interviewing Emmett Smith at the Rady dinner, and I got to sit at the head table with Ed, uh, with Wade Miller, uh, as well as Emmett. But I also got a chance to spend and meet in person for the first time Phil Dos Santos, and I, you know, maybe we gave him a little bit of a WST bump. How about the Valor boys? Two nice wins on the road, six points. They had gone through a little bit of a rough stretch, but a, a huge couple of victories on the road, I imagine uh, the lads will be feeling pretty good coming back to the peg after those two wins. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, it's a good point about getting some love for Valor here. Uh, Huss, um, they won Sunday in, against York. York's pretty banged up, so that I don't think that surprised too many people. But they went into Hamilton last night <clears throat> and shut out a team that had 14 goals in their last four games. So it it uh, they're starting to go go in the right direction and. It's good to get the the Winnipeg Sports Tech uh, bump, I guess, because uh, it really helped them. And they're back in the playoff discussion. They're getting healthy again. Um, It should be interesting to see what they do in the next little while. Well, I was joking with Phil. I'd say, hey, Phil, no matter what, when you guys are back, we'll have you on the show. But it'll be a lot more fun of a conversation if we're talking about two road wins. And, hey, they went out and got it done. So uh, give them my best. We'll look forward to setting that up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but let's get to the Bombers. Um, a very weird schedule this week for the team. I mean, you've got this. And in some ways, maybe this will be a benefit. We'll see what happens next week on a short week. Um, but, you know, they still have their three bye weeks later on. And in a lot of ways, a mini bye week for the club coming off their win last Friday at home. Yeah, a little bit of uh, it. The schedule is goofy right now. First of all, I don't know why it's a Monday game in Toronto, Monday, July 4th. But uh, it's not a holiday in Toronto. Uh, uh, that's an odd schedule. And then Saturday, the following Saturday in B.C., the Bombers play five of their next six games on the road. So it's very odd. Um, you know, you get a good buzz going here at home and then the team will be gone for most of July. Um, it, you're right, though. It, it, the timing is pretty good after the 3-0 and start and, and, you know, guys need a break. The bye week, they're the last team to get a bye on the schedule. So it, uh, right back at work today, um, they'll practice again tomorrow and Saturday and then fly to Toronto for Monday's game on Sundays. It just seems like it, it, the timing is weird. Um, but nobody's uh, kind of uh, looking down their nose at a couple days off, that's for sure. They're back at work today, and I guess the big news today was that Nick Dembski 
didn't practice. And from what I'm being told now and sort of breaking news for you, Huss, it looks like he'll be put on the six game injured list. That'll be announced uh, in a little while. So that's th- that's a tough break for the Bombers. Well, it certainly is. And he had that huge play getting right down to the goal line in the, right. the game last uh, last weekend. Um, just to clarify for people that may be not familiar with the way the uh, roster designations work, being put on the six-game injured list does not necessarily mean he's out for the next six games. That's correct. You can pull a guy off early. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of times the teams make this decision for the financial reasons, because of when a guy's put on that list, it, I don't think it counts against the salary cap. I could be wrong on that, but um, it, it there is a chance that he would come back earlier. But it's just it means that in the short term, you know, Monday's game and probably next Saturday is probably uh, uh, unlikely that we'll see Nick Dembski. So Brendan O'Leary Orange was getting a lot of work there today. He's the guy that finished up for Nick when he got hurt. The other night against Hamilton and did a pretty good job. I thought he looked great. Yeah, I, I was sitting with a bunch of people and they were going, "Who the hell is number 84? And it was funny. He's got such a long name. Like unless you've got really good eyesight, depending on where you're sitting, if you're not familiar with the name, you know, you really had to look. But I mean, he was far from a passenger when he got into the game on Friday night. You're right. He's a different body type than Nick. He's six foot four, kind of the big, tall, almost like a tight end type uh, body. Um, got some good speed, good hands. A bomber draft pick that played at uh, Nevada, uh, University of Nevada. Um, and then the Bombers drafted him. His dad was his Doyle Orange, who played for the Argos back in the 70s. Um, so he's got, it, he's got it in his bloodlines. He's an interesting prospect. I know when he was in college, he had some uh, injury issues, and he get, got to Winnipeg. And, and made the club last year, but had some injury issues as well. Got to play at the end of the year. They really like him. They, he came to camp uh, really fit, um, changed his body type is, is how we were told. Slimmed down a little bit. He looks quick. He looks fast. And you're right. He did it. It's not easy coming off the bench like that, you know, as much as teams tell you to be prepared for that. And I thought he did a really good job against Hamilton. Uh, and Doug Phil just asking how the Canadian race show is impacted with Dembski out. I mean, I guess if you're bringing O'Leary Orange in, it uh, wouldn't be affected at all. No, not at all. Um, that's the that's the power of drafting well and having good Canadian depth. That you know, we were talking about this at practice today. The Bombers were actually you have to start seven Canadians, and the Bombers have been starting eight in a lot of times because you've got the three American O linemen. You've got Brady in the backfield. You've got two receivers, Jake Thomas, and then now at safety, Malcolm Thompson. So uh, a lot of flexibility with the ratio, even when you have an injury like this. Um, Eddie, uh, over on the defensive side of the football, no Winston Rose last week in the win. Um, just reading your reporting from practice, he was uh, back. How's he looking? And uh, well, uh, any other injuries that the team is dealing with other than uh, the very significant one to Nick Dembski now with Rose back? And, and do we expect him to play Monday, I guess? Yeah. Um, Winston Rose took a lot of the snaps early in practice. And then uh, Demario Houston, who did such a good job the other night, was taking a lot of the work today, too. Um, you know, the, the usual suspects like Michael Couture is out. He's on six game. You know, still no Brandon Alexander. He's on six game. Michael Couture. I mean, sorry, Nick Dembski now. So those three starters right there. Pat Newfeld had a day off today. Um the first day back is always difficult to get a read on because uh, some of these guys just, you know, Mike O'Shea has so much trust in them. He gives them the chance to, you know, take care of yourself, especially with this schedule, like next Monday and then Saturday, traveling from Toronto to BC and then the five and the next six on the road. I think we'll see a lot of this in the next few weeks where guys, even if they have a small nick or, you know, something bothering them, they'll, they'll get the day off and just be ready to go on game day. Now, uh, Ed, of course, the team will practice through the weekend. You mentioned travel Sunday. The game is Monday night. This is the Andrew Harris game. Uh, right. Andrew Harris going up against his old teammates. And um, uh, there's no other way to put it. You can't sugarcoat it. They got their asses kicked by the British Columbia Lions 44-3 to last week. And I'm sure that didn't sit well with Andrew Harris. What do you expect from the Argonauts as a club coming back from that embarrassment and in particular, number 33, who will um, who will have had this date on top of mind since the second pen hit paper with the double blue. <laughs> yeah, this will be a big one um, for them. That You know, they're returning home, as you said, after getting kind of kicked around in, in B.C., 44 to 3. 
Um, you know, Andrew Harris only had seven carries in that game. It just seemed to kind of come unraveled in a hurry. I don't know if you saw there was some shots later in the game when um, McLeod Bethel Thompson came out of him, John, with the head coach, Ryan Dinwiddie, on the sideline. So um, I don't know why a quarterback would be surprised he'd be pulled in a game that they're losing 44-3, to but that's a whole other story. Andrew Harris is going to be jacked up. We know that he's jacked up for a, a practice. He's jacked up for an inter-squad game. So when you, as you put it, Huss, the minute he put his name to an Argonaut uh, contract, I'm sure he was checking the schedule to see when, when Winnipeg played it. it. It's again, it's a shame that there's no game in Winnipeg this year with the Argos, but um, he'll be fired up, and I'm, I'm sure that these guys will be fired up to play him too. That they weren't saying much here after practice today about you know, facing Andrew Harris, it was all about we're playing the Toronto Argonauts on Monday, and I think that's going to be the party line through the weekend. Well, the party line will be there, but I think that we'd all be naive if we didn't think that uh, the likes of the Blommers will. I mean, hey, this guy has been their teammate, one of their leaders for a number of seasons. They know exactly the dude that he is and how motivated he will be to have a big game. And and the bottom line is, if he can have a big game, that'll be huge for the Toronto Argonauts. Um, so stopping Andrew Harris, I'm sure, will be uh, at the top of the defensive game plan from Richie Hall when things get going. Um, Eddie, uh, elsewhere in the league, we have a really interesting game tonight. I mean, I kind of think that this game tonight might be sort of the game of the week. Um, Nathan Rourke, his incredible start to the season, 2-0. and They're, you know, on the road this time going up against an Ottawa team that, you know, you could make an argument maybe deserves a better fate than their record right now. Um, uh, what do you think about this game tonight? And can BC keep rolling, or is this the time for the Ottawa Red Blacks to step up in front of their home crowd and maybe cool the Jets a little bit on uh, BC's ascension to the top of the CFL after two games? Yeah, this is going to be a really fun one tonight. You know, um, <clears throat> the Nathan Work story has taken over the CFL, right? It's an amazing story. He's done remarkable remarkably well I, I love how quickly the ball comes out of his hands and he spreads it around he makes good decisions uh but you're right Huss it'll be very interesting to see what Ottawa's defense does against them. Mike Benavides their defensive coordinator is an excellent coach and we saw the trouble that they gave Winnipeg for a couple of games uh defensively a lot of different looks a lot of pressure and uh they've got a really good secondary so this would be a good test for Nathan Rourke and you know, we probably keep saying that week after week after week, but um, the kid keeps passing. So we'll see what he does uh, tonight against the Benavides and company. And then he's got Winnipeg coming up, too. So these are going to be two tough battles for, for Nathan Work and the Lions. And if they can get through those, then I'll tell you what, we'll, the, the narrative was only going to grow louder and louder about the Canadian quarterback being a potential star. Um, you know, I've been seeing and reading a lot of things lately about him being the best quarterback in the CFL. And you can certainly make that case statistically. Uh, but the guy here in this building has been pretty damn good. He's a reigning, most outstanding player. Um, he's got a couple of great cup rings. And do wins so, still matter? I think they do. I think they <laughs> do. And so does the jewelry, right? The big, those big gaudy doorknob rings. So, um, that, you know, you, you never want to look past Monday because Monday, is like, as you said, it's got some really juicy storylines with Winnipeg playing Andrew Harris and all that stuff. Uh, but that game next, uh, you know, a week from Saturday in, in uh, Vancouver is going to be a lot of fun, too, because um, I, I can't wait to see Winnipeg's defense go after this kid because he's been look, he's been really, really good. Well, and, and this is, you know, I mean, we, we want to talk about spot games. I mean, Dusty and I and when we're doing the lock shop, talk about it all the time. I mean. Part of the reason why I was on Montreal last week was the fact that Saskatchewan was on the short week, was traveling to a team that was rested, and we saw what happened. And, um, you know, I don't expect the same thing to happen this week. But, I mean, for Winnipeg, you're in Toronto on Monday. You're coming back or a day or two of rest, and then you're playing against a very good team on Saturday. I mean, one of the more challenging periods of the schedule. And I think it, you know, it would bode well to make the most of the extra rest you had this week and try and get to 4-0, which they obviously will, against the Toronto Argonauts. Funny, Ed, though, we've been talking about Canadian quarterbacks and Nathan Rourke. He's not the only Canadian quarterback starting this week. Ford, the first-round pick of the Elks, is starting for Chris Jones. And I had to laugh. <laughs> I had to laugh. I saw someone just tweeted us asking where they could find Charles Rogers 
on uh, on the CFL Fantasy and on DraftKings this week. He wasn't listed, and Bombing popped in. Well, that's because he started at safety last week for the Edmonton Elks. What the hell is going on with Chris Jones? I mean, is this just a glorified preseason right now for Edmonton with guys going in and out? Apparently, there's two players that were there at the start of training camp that have started both ga- all the games for Edmonton so far. I mean, it, it, I've never seen a revolving door like this before. Yeah, you're, t- you're talking about Charles Nelson, right? Or t- Nelson, excuse me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, the last, I looked at their depth chart this morning, Huss, and he's listed at running back. So, yeah. uh, you know, give him a few more weeks, he'll be playing D tackle with this team. Who knows, <laughs> right? Um, I'm a little bit worried about the Trey Ford storyline. I mean, as a Canadian, we're all cheering for the Canadian quarterbacks to do well. Uh, I want to see... Um, I want to see Trey Ford do well, but this is a big, uh, this is a tall, a big ask of them right now to to make, put him behind center against on the road against the defense that you know kind of really came out Winnipeg last week. I thought Hamilton's defense looked really good, and so now he's going to get a start. And uh, you know, is it too soon? That's what I would worry about. And I, you know, I've watched the, the, the Elks play their two games. And I don't think Nick Arbuckle's been the problem. They got a lot of problems going on there. I thought Arbuckle was developing some chemistry with Kenny Lawler and some of the other receivers. You know, he's, he hasn't been perfect, but, you know, they're changing their old line. Everything's changing there. Uh, and that, so to make the change at quarterback is an odd one to me. Uh, you know, Chris uh, Jones is the mad scientist, and um, some of these formulas and potions he's mixing it better start turning into something, right? Because they yeah. – uh, Oh, and something in a hurry here. It reminded me when Morgan Barron jumped on the program with us at the end of the season, we were talking about his time in uh, it, 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 with the Manitoba Moose. And at the time he had come, um, you know, the Jets were dealing with COVID and the Moose were playing with COVID. And I mean, there was like five or six guys that were literally getting introduced to each other during the warmups. And it seems like that's happening every week right now for the Edmonton Elks. And man, it's a tough neighborhood to start 0-4 in, in this Western division, as yeah. usual. It makes you wonder if they should go back to those old days where the Elks start putting their players' names on the front of their helmet written on masking tape, right? So just so that they can know who the hell they are when they get into the huddle with each other. Um, Look, uh, Chris Jones has the resume that makes you think, okay, we'll we'll give him this, but um, they didn't win a home game last year. There's some people in Edmonton that are getting a little bit frustrated or already a, a little bit frustrated with what's going on. And, they better start seeing some results soon because uh, um, it's it's just been – it's strange. It's bizarre theater. It, it's neat to watch from afar, but if you're in uh, Elks Nation right now, I think you'd be uh, pretty frustrated. Well, the results we're concerned about is uh, our fourth victory for the Blue and Gold. Uh, the game goes on Monday night. We'll, of course, preview it on Monday as we'll be back on after the long weekend. And uh, have yourself a great weekend. I hope you made the most of the week earlier because I know there'll probably be some time spent in the stadium this weekend. Uh, but hopefully all goes well, travel safe, and uh, we'll look forward to catching up real soon, maybe ahead of that big game against the BC Lions uh, a week Saturday. Absolutely, Huss. Thanks for having me on. Have fun in Dauphin, okay? You got it. Appreciate it so much. There's Ed Tate. Give him a follow on Twitter at Ed Tate WFC for the latest from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and check out all of Ed's great coverage at BlueBombers.com. All right, folks, don't go anywhere. Marble's coming up. Uh, yeah, weekend is here, though. Great time to uh, maybe take the fam out for a blizzard over at one of the Nick and Nicky DQs. Nick and Nicky, of course, have four locations in Winnipeg. Niverville, or, well, southern Manitoba. Niverville, and then three in Winnipeg. Northgate, Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. All three of the Winnipeg locations also available on Skip the Dishes if you're not making it out. May I will admit I had an order uh, earlier this week and uh, highly recommend the Reese's Pieces Cookie Dough Blizzard if you haven't tried it oh, so far at the top of my Blizzard Power Pole right now. Big thanks to Nick and Nikki. And hey, hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba if you'd like to custom order a cake for an upcoming event. Um, CFL gets going tonight. I think I might pop by with a few of the fellas to a Boston pizza and check out tonight's game between BC and Ottawa. Great happy hour specials from 6 to 9 and 9 to midnight at all local BPs. And of course, they've got their great new summer menu as well including the Carnitas Pizza and Tacos and Pizza Flights are back as well. And, of course, you can also check out their game day deals and order online at bostonpizza.com. We are going to get to our cool bet lines in a minute. And then 
We'll crack a CC and ginger and get ready for some marbles. Let's get Remus back in here. And uh, Remo, busy, busy day. I had to laugh speaking with Ken and Brandon. Uh, apparently, Woj and Shams are reporting that Kevin Durant has requested a trade from the Brooklyn Nets in the NBA. And of course, he now apparently, according to many people in the chat, another target of the Winnipeg Jets. The Jets should get KD. Uh, I joke, of course, but uh, uh, it's not just here in Winnipeg that there's some wild trade speculation going on in this offseason. Yeah, that's a weird one for me, uh, Kevin Durant requesting a trade. Didn't he sign there as a free agent a couple years ago and try to recruit other guys there to become that's a yes, super yes. team? Didn't that happen? And now that they flamed out in the playoffs, he's saying, trade me? Well, of course, they also did have Citizen Kyrie, who decided not to get vaxxed and missed all those games this year. Uh, and then earlier this week said that he was maybe going to leave. And then, of course, opted in on his $37.8 million deal. I think KD is somewhat sick of what's happened there. I don't think he wants to deal with Kyrie. I don't think he particularly wants to deal with Ben Simmons, although that was probably an upgrade over what he was dealing with with James Harden. The guy I feel sorry, well, not that much because he's making a ton of money as Steve Nash having to deal with all of these egos in Brooklyn. But uh, anyways, for you NBA fans, that's a pretty significant story heading out. Um, all right, we are going to do some marbles, folks. If you haven't already, all you need to do, make sure you've hit that red subscribe button so you are eligible to play. Uh, Remo, why don't we open up the contest, get people in, uh, get people signing up. Um, and again, if you haven't been here before, don't go anywhere. All you're going to need to do as soon as the contest is open, pay attention to the chat. You'll put in exclamation mark marbles and uh, we'll gather all the names. Everyone will get a marble and uh, we'll fire that out at the end of the uh, at the end of the program. Just before we do that. And again, you don't need to do it yet. Oh, the raffle has been canceled. Sorry, yeah, are we? I have to clear it last week. I have oh, to clear gotcha. the list. That's me clearing last week. People, some people got in a bit early. Okay, so. do it again, folks. If you went a little early, there you go. You see what everyone's doing? Exclamation mark marbles. Get in there. Normally, this is a Friday staple of the program, but with tomorrow being Canada Day, we're going to do it today. We know you cannot miss your weekly marble race here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. While we get the entries in, let's take a look at our cool bet lines. And uh, tonight in the Canadian Football League, what do we have? We've got four games. First game tonight is BC and the Ottawa Red Blacks. Oh, I'm feeling pretty good about my Ottawa bet at plus four earlier this week because the line is down to two. BC, two-point favorites on the road against the Ottawa Red Blacks and Ottawa at plus 114 on the money line. Not too bad on a home dog that's uh, trailing by two points. BC, if you just think that they're going to win, you can get them at minus 139. Other lines haven't really moved very much in the last day or so. Elks, seven-point underdogs at Hamilton. Thought that line might move a little bit when we heard that Ford was starting, as well as all the other roster upheaval with Chris Jones. Uh, but both of these teams are 0-3. Who's going to be 0-4? Hamilton is the favorite, seven-point home favorites. Uh, tomorrow, we've got the Muncher, or sorry, I guess that would be Saturday. We've got the Alouettes and Rough Riders playing in Saskatchewan. Riders, five-point favorites at home to avenge that butt-kicking they took at the hands of Montreal last week. And then no game on Sunday. And Monday night football, 6.30 start Winnipeg time. Bombers, five-point favorites right now against the Toronto Argonauts. Um, there's also plenty of Wimbledon to bet on. And uh, John Deere and Liv going on right now, but pay attention to Cool Bet for all of the latest. And if you haven't played a Cool Bet before, use the promo code WST. It will get you a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to $200. All right, exclamation mark marbles. I think just about everybody is in there. And uh, I see, oh, I see Mike wins there. Hey, Mike, one of our most loyal, loyal um, uh, supporters of Winnipeg Sports Talk is also the birthday boy today. So a special happy birthday to Mike. Hope you have a great weekend, pal. And uh, a former winner here on WST as well in the marble race. And congratula uh, congratulations to Shane Mason, who was our winner and popped by yesterday to pick up the, uh, the famed WST hoodie, our version of the Masters Green Jacket. So... Um, let's, uh, finish that up. We'll get everybody into the, uh, into the race. And in the meantime, Remo, 
I guess, have you been paying attention to uh, the hijinks and festivities in Denver as the Avalanche celebrate their uh, Stanley Cup championship with their fans? I'm paying attention. I have some highlights ready to go. You know, the Stanley Cup celebration is always a pretty fun time. Um, I forgot about, I saw a highlight video on um, on Instagram. I forgot about uh, Patrick Kane's speech, Brad Marchand singing Black and Yellow. Corey Crawford <laughs> dropping dropping f bombs. Um, who else dropping? John Quick dropping f bombs. Brad Hull's we Brad's went blues. To say, Brad Hull we Le- went blues. And I almost forgot about Alex Ovechkin's like Stanley Cup celebration tour, tour. <laughs> which was incredible. And I know the um, the Avs took the cup to the Rockies game yesterday. I don't think we saw any uh, cup stands. Those are banned. But I just remember Ovechkin doing a cup stand and like doing the Hulk Hogan like this while everyone's chanting Ovi. And it looked like he could barely stand. It was and like the fountain. I don't think we got any of that, but there was some some highlights um, here. I'm scrolling through Twitter and here we got uh, we got the Sportsnet has put up some pictures. Here's the Whoa! here's the crowd there for the stage. It looks like a good time. I'll just go through these. Here's. Okay, this is Gabe Landeskog. Gabe Landeskog and McKinnon in the street. Um, what do we got here? And Landeskog's got his kid and his young young child there in the middle of the street. They're being These showered. These guys all on priests. foot? Like, did they have no vehicles for this parade? Or uh, they were in? <laughs> is it a walking tour? No, they. So they were on fire trucks, and we can get to those. And they all got off. And then went to, um, and just some of them stole like police bikes and rode around. You got to have crowd interaction, so they would walk around. Um, here's another view of the stage. Will Peterson, oh. your guy, putting this out there. Hey, Will, what a hell of a f- shot there! Yeah, You're have yeah. to get Will on next well, week. Might talk have to talk to aftermath. Will. Yeah, I think that would be fun. Okay, what do we got here? Oh yeah, so this is them on the on the fire truck in Denver. So this is what it looked like. Sorry, podcast listeners. The Landeskog lifting the cup over his head. He's a big star here. Uh, big star of the show. So that's kind of cool. There's a couple, couple other things that I saw. A couple of the injured players, uh, you know, making it out. Sam Girard looked pretty good. He, of course, got knocked out earlier in the playoffs. We saw him uh, icing himself, if you will, getting down on one knee and crushing one in, the, in front of all the fans. And Nick Chushkin, and I know we talked about just how badly his foot was broken and how incredible it was that he played. Mm-hmm. For some ama- like, you know, talking to doctors going, this is, you know, like a seven out of 10 break. Hard to believe he was even able to get a skate on and participate. Um, he's in a wheelchair for the uh, procedures well, today. So uh, he's got to get ready to sign a new deal. I have to, I'll, I'll show you the picture of his broken foot. It was crazy. So one of my friends who's a doctor sent it to me and was like, this is insane. This is the most badass thing I've ever seen. Uh, him playing with a, with that break. I mean, his foot was totally purple and he played, hold on. Let me, let me bring it up. Uh, oh yeah, here he tweeted it out or he put it on his Instagram story. And thankfully the power of screenshots, you could do this. So here's. Here's the foot. It's all purple. And then he got the break. Like, crazy that he wow. would play like that. Like, and he's in a, I mean, I, I'm sure they're taking some serious uh, medication. Is that the, yeah, the we'll go with medication, medication yeah. to be able to play? <laughs> and like, you couldn't even notice that he, I know uh, Tampa like complained about all their injuries. Um, who, but uh, I mean, you couldn't even tell Nakushkin was injured the way he played, he earned himself a nice, a nice playoffs. Uh, let's do some more pictures. Okay, this was the maybe the one of the quotes of the thing. Miko Rantanen saying, "I'm gonna lose my ability to speak English after the parade." Should we, should we just give her here? <laughs> yeah, let her let her fly. Uh, first of all, can't hear it. I'm gonna say sorry that I lost my ability to speak any English after the parade. Uh, it was a tough parade for me and Lecky which is Arturi Lekin had heard of him, you know, so. But uh, I just want to thank everybody who's in here. I want to thank all the people that DJ thanked, all the same, same people, the owners, everybody, all the fans. And, and uh, like I said, I, I can't really speak any English now, so. I'm just going to try to talk to Lekin the rest of the night, so. Love you guys. Love you, everybody. 
<laughs> oh. Oh, oh, the Finns. There's a lattice god okay. with the Swedish flag. Got nothing better than a Stanley Cup championship. This was a long time coming for the Colorado Avalanche. Okay, la watch. See Lannis Gog. He's got his jersey on and the flag, but uh, didn't last too long. Here he is shortly after Lannis Cog. And this is what he had to say to the crowd. Here it is. The city of Denver, the state of Colorado, you guys have been fucking amazing for the last 10 years. So there's, that was the <laughs> F-bomb. Oh, the mandatory F-bomb dropped at the, uh, <laughs> at the parade. Well, they're having a good time, uh, as they certainly uh, well-deserved. Uh, and as I said, just go to social media. You'll be able to get uh, all sorts of feedback. And... Uh, Live eyewitness reports on the Avalanche Gong Show. That is the celebration party. All right, the raffle's closed. We're gonna get the uh, we're gonna get everything lined up for our marble race again. If you haven't already, make sure you just hit that red subscribe button. And by the way, now is a great time to remind you for all the YouTube subscribers. Make sure you turn your notifications on. Um, normally, you'll get a notification. Boom, one o'clock. We're live. The show's on, which is always helpful. But in times like these, where news could break at any moment, we will certainly do our best to uh, jump on at times when we know that there's a new head coach, if there's a trade and whatnot, and you don't want to miss that, especially those of you that are such a big part of our community in the YouTube chat. So turn the notifications on and make sure you're subscribed because, of course, you do have to be subscribed to win. And I should give a big thanks to our friends at Canadian Club because, of course, they've been with us since we started doing these marble races and work with us to put together the uh, hoodies that have been so popular with all of our winners. I know Shane picked one up yesterday after his big win last week and uh, said that uh, he's going to be rocking that one around the soccer fields and rinks following his kids around. And obviously, we really do appreciate that. So uh, let's get ready for marbles. But I will remind you that, um, of course, Canadian Club is a staple of the Canada Day long weekend. Uh, but now the drink of the summer is the CC and ginger. Saw a ton of people enjoying them at the Bomber game last week. And I have a feeling you'll see quite a few of those around. You can pick it up at your local liquor marts. But Bomber fans, you still have a couple days to take advantage of a great deal at the Canadians beer stores. Buy a six-pack of Canadian Club and ginger ready to drink cocktail at any of the Canadians. And you'll get a free Bomber Slim Can koozie. And you'll be entered to win an autographed Blue Bomber jersey. And they're giving away a jersey at each uh, Canadian's vendor here in the city of Winnipeg. And, of course, CC teamed up with us for uh, the greatest prize in WST. Immortalized if you can win the marble race. And that is coming up right now. Uh, Remo, where, uh, how many folks are in today and where are we going? Okay. I haven't submitted the list. You have 154 names in do we want to add any bonus marbles yeah. we've had barry trotz he was removed from he's banned. last week yeah. he's banned yeah barry is out um <laughs> rewiki yeah ed tate yeah and ken definitely in yeah um uh you know what let's let's give some good vibes to the newest starter for the bombers brandon o'leary orange all caps bolo b-o-l-o -O. and uh, when you see that you'll know that that's Brandon O'Leary Orange, not the sauce you get with the Boston Brute uh, if you're popping by a Boston pizza on the weekend. Um, so we can get Bolo in there. Anybody else? Uh, oh, Brent, Brent Fitz. Fitz. Yeah. Brent Fitz, for sure. We've got to get Fitz in there. And um, now PLD's agent's not getting one. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, shouldn't <laughs> <do> Bob <Bog> get one? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Let's give PLD one. Maybe a victory in the marble race will, you know, maybe thaw things a little bit mm -hmm. and um, let him know what a big part he is of the Winnipeg sporting community. And um, and you know what? Let's give let's give a, a a marble to Andrew Harris because we want something. We love Andrew. Uh, we want good things to happen. And hopefully the start of the weekend with him being in the marble race will be better than the end of the weekend. And what awaits when uh, he sees his former teammates coming up on Monday night when the Winnipeg Blue Bombers head to BMO Field to take on the Toronto Argonauts. All right, we've got the field set. We will get the course ready. Where, where are we going to go today? Uh, let me just save these. So we've got 161 in. I think we've been doing marble races now for like a year. If I had to guess. 
Like I would I would say something like that. So I have all these like all these files each week. I save the names. So I I, I don't really keep track of them. But let me see what we, where we can go. I'll do a nice race here for Canada. I don't know if you notice. I'm wearing my Canada flag hat. This is a new era snapback, Huss. I don't know how I got this one, but it's just got the straight flag. <laughs> Yeah, on the front. There's no, I don't think there's too many of these out there. <laughs> you just pull that out once a year. Just this is the only day. July first. This is the only day I can wear it. Yeah, I don't wear. I wear it once a year. So uh, I had put to put it I had way, to while you're out. getting this up. I was going to say, oh, well, you got to wear it in August during the World Junior Championships. And I'm not even joking about this. I'm really interested to see what the future of this tournament is. I was somewhat skeptical to begin with when they wanted to reschedule it based on the cancellation in the off season. And now with all the turmoil around Hockey Canada, the premier sponsors that are such a huge part of putting the tournament on, pulling their support away from the world juniors and the men's side of things. Um, you know, I was listening to a Dusty show today earlier, and there are some ads for tickets going on on like the TSN station out in Edmonton. Um, but this is going to be a very different World Junior Championship. It already would have. And now with the black cloud around Hockey Canada and the aftermath of uh, the incident, the uh, the settlement, and what they heard and didn't hear from Hockey Canada at the House of Commons a couple weeks ago, um, it is going to be a very, very interesting scenario as to um, how this tournament goes off, um, the reception from fans as well. Um, especially with being in the middle of August. But uh, we'll deal with that coming up in the weeks to come. Right now, we're getting into the weekend. We're finishing it off the only way we know how, a marble race on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, Remo, where, where as commissioner of the thing, and by the way, yeah, but if you haven't already hit that thumbs up button, folks do. We've almost got 400 people in here. We'd love to uh, get that. Definitely always helps us uh, spread the channel. And um, even if you're catching up on Winnipeg Sports Talk sometime when we're not live, anytime you can hit the thumbs up, we really do appreciate it. It helps uh, get the word out on what we're doing here on WST. Um, all right. Going into Canada Day weekend, finishing off a great month of June, another record-breaking month for us. Thanks again to everyone that's been a part of our shows over the course of uh, the last four weeks. Uh, record May was record-breaking, and um, we continue to do it. And I think we'll put out something official over the course of the weekend. But thanks to everyone, especially you YouTube viewers, just past the 1 million mark for views on YouTube. And uh, we had already passed a million on the podcast download, so... Really uh, proud of those numbers, and uh, but mostly grateful. And thanks to all of you for making us a part of your day. Remo, take it away. Where's uh, the uh, end of June into Canada Day long weekend marble race taking place? Well, before we do that, it's time to oh, hit, of course, hit Tristan, the music. <laughs> Okay, here is the track. Oh, Mountain, what's this one? Mountain Mingle. I tried to do... Um, this is new. We've never done this before. Yeah, I was going to do the Factory 2, but then I realized, oh, we did the Factory 2 last week. Yeah, we've done a lot of factories lately. I like the Mountain Mingle. I always like when we're doing a new track. No one's seen it before. Uh, good luck to everybody that is in the chat, everyone that's thrown in. Again, first place. We've got a hoodie for you. Hopefully we've got your size. We'll deal with that once you win. Uh, but heading into the long weekend, been another great week here. Thanks for being with us. Remo, I think there's only one thing left to do before we crack in 1919 and enjoy the long weekend. And that, my friend, is drop the marbles. Here we go. And they're off. They are off. Here we go. This is an interesting one. The, uh, the Mountain Mingle, similar to the factory with the start. Jano, Jano with a nice uh, run. There's Tristan Rivers music. Uh, he's in there. Earl James, running man. Still waiting to see who. Jano, oh, huge start for Jano. Nice, like a big lead, actually. Rarely have we seen someone with such a big lead right out of the gate. Uh, Doug Phil, who's been in chat. Tristan Rivers music is there as well. Former winner. 
everyone chasing Jano though right now to begin the mountain mingle. PLD. PLD has had a great start as well. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something if Dubois won the marble race today? That might be a great sign for his future with the Winnipeg Jets. I'm just saying right now. Uh, but uh, looks like Jano's fallen back a little bit. Now it literally is anybody's race. Uh, but no, Jano is back in the mix. We've got a big corkscrew coming up. PLD, Pierre-Luc Dubois is hot on Jano's <laughs> hot on Jano's trail right now. Uh, Alec Moore, Dallas Paul's in the mix as well. Very impressive start by Pierre-Luc Dubois. Can he catch Jano though right now, who uh, by my calculation is continuing to be the leader? We've got a double funnel action. Jano is in on the right. Uh, PLD right behind him, getting pretty close. Free Oleg. Free Oleg all of a sudden getting to the start. That would be one of the stories of the year if Free Oleg were to win the marble race after Oleg was banned a long time ago. <laughs> Let's see what's up with PLD. Tristan Rivers music in the mix. Wow, this is a good one. The, uh, the mountain mingle. Anything goes. And there is uh, a ton of marbles that are still in the mix. It looks like Free Oleg is oh, oh, at the, oh. the front... Whoa! What just happened? Shortcut. Shortcut indeed. And who's it going to be? Tyler Fabry or S. Elber? Tyler. That was wild. I'm not sure how it happened, but every now and then there is some sort of a uh, <laughs> a shortcut, a hack, if you will. And there it is. Tyler Fabry. A shocking late run into the end of the mar of the uh, mountain mingle and Tyler Fabry is your winner S Elder second place John D Nobby Kankles in a, <laughs> in fourth uh Stogie man Jano really did have a great run there but it just didn't end up for him so here's your top 10 folks Fabry Elder John D Nobby Kankles Stogie man Eagle Eyes, Earl James, Sean Fieldman, Bruce H., and Sean Dick, and a, a whole bunch of uh, over-the-top ropes at the end. A number of, uh, there's Bolo, PLD. PLD had such a great start. Not a great finish, though, for Pierre-Luc Dubois. Um, Tyler, congratulations. Send us an email at winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. Let us know what size you are. I'm going to be away for the weekend, but uh, we'll hit you up next week and uh, make it a time for you to pop by and pick up your uh, up, uh, your hoodie. Let us know what size you are as well. Um, wow, this has been a fun show. Great stuff with Ken Weeb, Brandon Rewicki, of course, and um, really appreciate Ed Tate jumping on with us to sort of tee up the weekend in the Canadian Football League and give us the latest on the Blue Bombers. Remo, what's up for the weekend for you? Are you just going to be hanging out at the zoo like normal, or uh, you got anything else on the on the docket? I'll probably make it out to the zoo so you, you see a near three year old kid uh, giving you a tour and naming all the dinosaurs. That is that is me and him and running away from his dad and yeah, running away. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're gonna make it out to uh, out to the beach tomorrow, and then we'll see. Probably enjoying some of the weather. I'm assuming. Hopefully, what's it supposed to be? Nice. I haven't even looked. Actually, let's let's check that out right now. Here's your quick WST weather report right now. Current conditions in the city of Winnipeg: partly cloudy, cloudy, and 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, we are looking at a high of 22. 30 percent chance of showers tonight. But looking ahead to the long weekend tomorrow in the city, mainly sunny and 21 degrees. Saturday, a little bit warmer, 23. And Sunday and Monday. Both 26, a mix of sun and cloud. So not too hot, uh, but still pretty nice. And it looks like we're going to have some sunshine. So wherever you are, make the most of it. Don't drink and drive. And uh, make sure you're back with us on Monday. Monday show should be big ream. I mean, I would imagine there's a very good chance we could have some clarity as to what's going on and who the next head coach of the Winnipeg Jets is. 
Um, and then, of course, three days counting down will be basically 72 hours up until the first round of the draft in Montreal on Thursday. And with that comes all sorts of interesting trade talk, speculation, and player movement around the NHL. And I think everyone agrees and expects that the Winnipeg Jets will have some sort of move, whether it's large or or smaller heading into Thursday with their two first round picks. Yeah, that that'll be fun on Thursday. We'll be here to recap it Friday all week talking jets. So I'll have to put up uh we had did the draft preview yesterday with Chris Peters. Go check that on yesterday's show. I'll put it up separately this weekend. But yeah, again, been uh, a great another great month as we wrap it up. Um we I think we grew over last month, which was a record month as well. As you said, just hit 1 million YouTube views which is really exciting and the march to uh we're close to 7500 subs on youtube the march to 10k is on so uh i'm you know this is this is fantastic hopefully the team gives us something to be happy about the bombers and the jets over the weekend yeah all right and of course a happy candidate to everyone uh whatever you're doing do it safely but have a great time and uh we'll be back to business uh, on monday and again for the YouTube folks, well, even if you're on the podcast right now, get onto YouTube at some point, get to Winnipeg Sports Talk, hit the red subscribe button, turn the notifications on, and if something breaks over the course of the weekend, we will have some impromptu content on anything that happens. But fingers crossed, they can just take a chill pill for the next three days and we can get to a big, big day on WST on Monday. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to uh, all of our sponsors who have made this uh, program possible. Everyone that's been with us, and of course, our guest today, a couple of our, well, three of our favorites, really, Eddie Tate, Brandon Rewicki, and of course, Ken Weeb as well. Hey, if you're out Dauphin Way, it'll be a country fest for a couple days on Monday or on Friday and Saturday, doing some stuff with the Lotteries gang, and we will be up on the uh, top of the hill. Of course, we had Brent Fitz on the program yesterday. Tuke will be playing around 1130 at the end of the main stage shows, so I'll certainly be around that if you are there. Pop by and say hi. For Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Patterson. Thanks for another great week and another great month on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have an awesome long weekend. And if we don't see you before, we'll be back Monday at 1 o'clock live here on WST. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.